lunch break with a hot lunch. So that's, uh, we don't expect a uh, uh, fire alarm, so if you hear a fire alarm, just make your way downstairs. <coughs> Uh, I wanted to start with uh, introducing our first speaker, uh, Tatiana Filewska, who is creative director of a Ukrainian institute in Kiev. And uh, this will be followed by the panel on uh, situation on Ukraine. Thank you so much, Alicia. Thank you, Centrala, for inviting me to this event. And thank you for um, dedicating it to Ukraine and inviting so many Ukrainian voices to it. It's, very, it's much appreciated and very important. And uh, I was asked to, to give an introductory talk about <coughs> this topic. And uh, I want to share some thoughts about, this, about the state of Ukrainian culture now and what we in the Ukrainian Institute um, are doing um, in order to support, to help uh, Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian creatives in the world. So you already know who I am. And Ukrainian Institute is the public institution that's affiliated with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine and works to bring Ukrainian culture to the world. Um, we also have our partners and good friends here, Ukrainian Institute in London, which is a separate institution, but is, um, is as, I, as I said, a very good friend and partner. Um, how are you? Is uh, something every conversation in Ukraine begins with. Because, um, as you might know, this tonight um, there were more shellings over Ukrainian cities. So many people in Ukraine... Sorry. Many people in Ukraine could not sleep this night. And this morning I started um, with, um, with the messages to my colleagues in Ukraine, who I know didn't have any sleep and had to spend their night in a bomb shelter or in a corridor with their little kids or their cats and families. And I think this question will, um, will be one of the most important for the next years or decades even in Ukraine. How is it connected to culture and creativity? Um, you might know this image from Borodanka, a, a little town outside of Ukraine, which um, had, um, which was severely shelled last year, and one of the uh, buildings was destroyed. And on the on the wall of one of the streets, we could see a kitchen cabinet standing, just miraculously, with a little um, um, pot, uh, with a little pot in the shape of a chicken, standing there. And it was a surprise to everyone how this cabinet remained on this wall, you know? It was just amazing. Um, and everyone started to um, answer this question, how are you, by saying that, well, just like the kitchen cabinet, holding, still holding. So this is the preface, let's say, to the creative, uh, creative community in Ukraine. We're still holding. And to continue the story with, the, um, with this item, with this thing, um, just a few days after this, uh, this photograph was uh, spread in the internet, um, a representative of Ukrainian creative company, uh, community, Lara Polianska, who is uh, a uh, who's herself from Kharkiv, but was in Kiev at the time, was carrying two of these chickens that she wanted to bring to her friends abroad as a present uh, on the main street of Kiev, and she accidentally bumped into Boris Johnson and uh, Volodymyr Zelensky just walking in the street. And she asked the security if she could give these presents to them, and she was. So it was just a spontaneous act which uh, led to the fact that one of these um, hens, one of these chickens, is now part of the museums in the UK. It's uh, as, as a gift to the prime minister, it was given to the museums, and is going to be kept in the UK um, museums as one of these object symbols of this invasion. Another one um, is always behind Volodymyr Zelensky in his office, and we can look, you know, and see that he is also holding up. So, in just a few weeks, this um, little thing, you know, just a regular jar that was in everyone's home, became a symbol of resistance of Ukrainian um, people. And it became circulating as one of the powerful images in the creative and cultural sphere. Artists started working with it 
in their artworks, uh, creative, industry start, creative industry started um, reproducing it as um, jewelry or even chocolates. So um, how culture helps us to resist and how culture helps us to be in solidarity. It comes intuitively and naturally at the particular moment, <laughs> the same way as Lera saw these you know, two men and she, she just decided jump, to jump in and, and give this to, to them and it immediately became a huge story. It unites different people because many of you might know that cultural community, artistic community, uh, was um, not that much supportive of Volodymyr Zelensky when he was first elected. But things changed and we are united as one nation, you know, in, in resisting the Russian aggression. Um, it can bring unexpected results and something un inobvious can become a symbol for everyone. <clears throat> it definitely inspires others and supports us in resistance and helps us to hold on. So speaking about the state of Ukrainian culture now, um, during the wartime, we can say that there are a lot of problems, of course. And of course, there's a, um, an interruption of natural flow or cooperation or of, of a dialogue between Ukraine and the rest of the world. It was disrupted uh, severely. Um, Ukraine um, is now known from the news headlines, but is it well understood? Is there, is, is there enough of knowledge and understanding of Ukraine? Uh, we're afraid not. Um, a huge brain drain from the cultural sphere is affecting the cultural, uh, the cultural life in Ukraine. And uh, it's a huge challenge how to bring those people who can work and who used to work in cultural sphere back to Ukraine, when and how. Um, of course, mobility is almost impossible. You know that sometimes even the, uh, there are governmental restrictions to go to Ukraine because of the invasion, because of the danger, because every night, you know, there is a shelling and no one can guarantee the safety. Um, international response, which was huge last year, was focused on kind of emergency basis. And uh, uh, unfortunately, what we have been witnessing since last year is kind of decrease of interest and lack of sustainable interest in Ukraine. And those who did events last year now are not opening their doors for Ukraine anymore and are back with business as usual with Russia, for example, which is upsetting. And unfortunately, this is also the case in the UK. And uh, cultural relations rely on strong resilience institutions within Ukraine. And that's, of course, a huge problem because Ukrainian cultural institutions, um, a lot of them look like this. Because um, cult Russia targets cultural institutions in, in Ukraine. Um, they um, bomb um, precisely certain museums. Um, theater, Mariupol theater, as, as you definitely know, uh, they loot museums, they do everything, you know, to erase Ukrainian culture and identity as such. But there are many ways that this can be, um, resi you know, for, uh, fought back and resisted. So what can we do as the international cultural community um, bringing um, our effort together? So we can program strategies of, of cultural institutions to, to include Ukraine by default. So when we are programming something, when you are programming something in advance in the next year, five, ten years, please think about you including Ukraine in a topic, a person, um, I don't know, um, um, just something um, from Ukraine. Um, think long term versus short term, term so that if there is an opportunity to have something not single, um, single event, yeah, but something that's, that's going to last longer, that would be preferred. Um, uh, of course, there is a lot of resources needed. So there, if there is an opportunity for production grants or funding schemes, that's something very much needed. Um, of course, art can survive only by practicing. So new commissions for Ukrainian artists and companies is something that can keep Ukrainian culture alive. All types of mentorships, capacity buildings, everything that can 
help Ukrainians be competitive, that can help them adopt and uh, can help them continue their uh, practice internationally would be a great support as well. And establishment of international branches of the Ukrainian Institute is something that we are working on and we are also relying on support from our partners because currently the funding for our activities are blocked or postponed until the better times, until the end of the war, and we are looking partnerships in that way. I want to give you a few examples of how uh, we in Ukrainian Institute try to deal with these things, how we changed our activities since the last year. And first example is from uh, the conference we had in Warsaw in the end of last year, which was um, dedicated actually to displaced Ukrainian creatives. We held it in Warsaw and it was the largest conference of Ukrainian creatives, I think, in the last year where we discussed these issues. How to, you know, what are the issues, what is needed and where, um, where we need to go from there. And we're preparing a publication which will kind of sum up all, all the conversations and we'll be able to share it publicly. So I will be happy to, to send it to the organizers of Centrala so that they can share with you. But the main thing was that creatives, even displaced creatives from Ukraine, consider themselves being part of Ukrainian cultural community. And what happens in Ukraine is crucial and super important for them as well. And... Um, um, what will happen after the invasion, how Ukrainian culture will be reconstructed means a lot of them uh, at this moment, so they are thinking about these issues. Um, last year we realized that we still need to explain to the world that Russians' war against Ukraine is a neo-colonial war because it's not obvious for the world, unfortunately. So we started a big program on kind of... Um, explaining this decolonial aspect, decolonial approach to Russia-Ukrainian uh, relationship. And uh, I curated uh, a program at uh, the Venice Biennale dedicated to decoloniality. It's available online, you can see all of it. Um, we are supporting a number of public institutions, public exhibitions um, around Europe and in the world that are um, um, center to showcase Ukrainian culture and that is something super important because because of its colonial position Ukrainian art was invisible it was a blind spot and now it's very important to give it a uh, to to make it a spotlight and to give it more attention um, what everyone can do for Ukraine is learn more about Ukraine and you know uh, tell more about Ukraine to the others. So we have lots of content and you can find lots of interesting stuff. So just, you know, dedicate five minutes every day to learn something about Ukraine. Um, there is uh, very little translation done from Ukrainian to other languages. So if you are working in the publishing sphere or if there is an opportunity to make uh, a publication, think about translating or inviting Ukrainian authors. Um, teach about Ukraine, about Ukrainian culture, art. There are ways to learn online and there are, of course, a lot of instruments to, uh, to, to teach in class. Um, and to remind about Ukraine because it's not that much on the news anymore, unfortunately, and the war is still happening and every day people are dying. Um, Ukraine is diverse and let's not forget about it. And Crimea will be Ukrainian to... Uh, to, to be returned back to Crimea, Tatar and Ginger's people. And uh, just to kind of sum up uh, all the activities, activities of the last year and a half, I just want to remind that uh, Ukrainian Institute together with the British Council is finishing its UK-Ukraine season, which was meant to be kind of a three months event, but ended up being more than a year event and is uh, come into, I think, 100 projects already. And uh, now in Liverpool, just a few miles from here, a huge festival of 24 projects is happening. So I won't do, go into details. And I'm, thank you so much for your attention. I hope I gave kind of an overview of what is happening with Ukrainian culture now. And I wish you all a great, successful and interesting discussion. Unfortunately, I won't be able to stay longer because I had previous commitments in Liverpool and I will have to run soon, but I, I'm with you with, with my thoughts and um, we'll stay in touch afterwards. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, <clears throat> Tatiana. Um, am I okay sitting here? Everyone can see me all right. Um, so our first panel, we have three fantastic Ukrainian artists um, who are going to be speaking about our theme today of solidarity um, and uh, between displaced Ukrainian artists and um, migrant creatives, creatives from Central and Eastern Europe. I'm Maria Montague. I'm the deputy director of the Ukrainian Institute London. And um, I'm really pleased to be moderating our first panel. Uh, the Ukrainian Institute London is an independent charity, and um, we are, we're based in London. We are working to champion Ukrainian culture and strengthen Ukraine's voice here in the UK. And uh, we run various uh, events, talks, cultural projects, and educational courses. Um, we're going to be speaking uh, quite a lot today about residencies, opportunities for Ukrainian um, and migrant artists. Uh, last year, the Ukrainian Institute London ran a uh, residency actually as part of the UK-Ukraine season, uh, supported by the Ukrainian Institute and the British Council, uh, which was for Ukrainian and British writers. Uh, it was called Ukraine Lab, uh, and writers were exploring global um, issues of disinformation, hybrid warfare, warfare and the environment uh, through Ukrainian perspectives. We very much hope to run more residencies like this in the future. And um, in general, we're very keen to play our part in, in building solidarity um, among Ukrainians and Central and Eastern European artists. So I'm really pleased to be here today. And thank you very much, Centrala, for organizing this conference and for all of your support um, to Ukraine over the past year. Um, so we're going to have three presentations um, uh, now from our panelists, which will be followed by a Q&A. Um, and uh, first of all, we look forward to hearing from um, Ludmila Lucy Nietzschei. Um, and uh, Ludmila is an uh, artist and researcher uh, there's, uh, and curator. There's more information about her on the slide there. Um, but Ludmila has a lot of experience of building networks and communities for artists in Ukraine. And um, she's been doing a lot of projects here in the UK um, with uh, D6 Culture in Transit in Newcastle and also with Hexam Art Community. Um, and in Ukraine, she has co-founded the Nazar Wojtovich um, Art Residency in Ternopil and worked on a whole host of other, other projects for creatives. She's also the co-founder of the NGO Congress of Cultural Activists. Um, and she's worked with the British Council as a facilitator for the Active Citizens Programme and many other projects. Um, and so we're really, really looking forward to hearing you, Ludmilla, and hearing your ideas of, of what more we can do to build solidarity and so support for Ukrainians um, and migrant artists um, and, and what ways you think we can improve these networks here in the UK. Thank you. Um, I need... Do you hear me? Yes. Um, if you um, don't mean I, I a little bit uh, read because I, I can't talk about my project um, whole time and it's not 50 minutes like to, <laughs> to ask me uh, the organizer and I uh, prepared the small thesis for my presentation. At first, uh, uh, who I am, um, thank you Maria, you present me enough um, full, but I want to say, to add just one thing. Um, but I very passion lies, uh, um, what my passion lies in the building and developing network and communities. Um, uh, why, why it's so matter for me uh, with event and with um, like a narrative of solidarity? It's become my very uh, core um, values, uh, science and my experience protesting during the revolution of dignity. It's uh, 2014 in Ukraine, what happened in Maidan, like so-called Maidan, maybe people more know about this name. And since this time, I focus on the achieving the positive ch uh, ch changes in the culture sector together with my colleague and we create the NGO Congress of Culture Activists to uh, collect the different um, colleague, fellow uh, culture activists and uh, make together this narrative for new, um, for new um, strategy for culture. Because before um, Maidan, we had a like, post-Soviet, absolutely Soviet system of culture. And after this, uh, this protest, we 
have the opportunity to collect the people around the Ukraine and the resort that they are needing and put this need into the new, um, developed new strategy. Uh, all my colleagues uh, will be ready to, would be, was ready to volunteer in all time and we volunteer in maybe two or three years to create the, uh, we, we collect the, um, uh, different surveys, we make the networking and we put this idea what we collect from the uh, people around the Ukraine put to the um, Ministry of Culture who make the new uh, like policy of culture for Ukraine. Um, my Ukrainian background in networking, it's uh, my NGO Congress of Culture Activist since 2014. Um, I maybe uh, show you <clears throat> it's like the picture for a uh, very beautiful picture from one, one networking weekend when we uh, invite the uh, Boyna Panevska to Ukraine uh, and she it's um, um, general uh, editor no it's a board of uh, head of board I think um, trans uh, transculture from um, Netherlands and uh, she uh, made the um, two workshops for Ukrainian, one workshop for Ukrainian um, managers, culture managers, uh, how to create the art residency. And ne next was for uh, artists, uh, how to search the art residency. And it means what we build the, around the <coughs> mobility and around the, some very important topic for Ukrainian culture, for Ukrainian um, artists. We uh, um, build the networking and build the opportunity to have uh, some knowledge about this. Because um, before Maidan, um, very rarely I can to find uh, some opportunity for Ukrainian artists, what, what, uh, f some opportunity for mobility. Because nobody don't put this uh, country to agenda. And uh, just after Maidan, we start to be more publicly. Um, my um, small initiative was started in <laughs> 2040. It was just a small uh, group in Facebook uh, where I put the uh, opportunity for artists and all artists who join to this group can put uh, the in information too. It is like the small uh, open data source, <laughs> but, but very pr pr primitive, yes. But uh, in this um, case, we have the 4,000 4, participants of this group, and uh, this group alive, still alive. Um, active citizens in Ukraine, it's become the, it's, it's uh, come um, to Ukraine in the same time when start them, uh, after Maidan. And uh, we was so interested in this program. What uh, for two years uh, the um, um, appear the 200, 200 national facilitator of this program in Ukraine, and so through the educational and culture sectors. And uh, in the end of uh, in, in the end of 2017, uh, people together, 12 very uh, um, big organization. Uh, decide to organize the association of active citizens and now it's a huge um, uh, networking in Ukraine and uh, thank you of this networking at the start of uh, full uh, scale um, uh, invasion in Ukraine uh, we had um, some budget for educational program but when start this uh, st start war we put this money for different supplies for living people in shelter to, for, for petrol for volunteer who bring the some um, human humanitarian aids and uh, make the evacuation and it was very um, like V very nice what we can do it around of Ukraine because we had a very very big uh, geographically this this um, association it's uh, from different regions of Ukraine um, and from 2021 I joined to the group of people of digital uh, d digital artists who appear from the uh, after the challenges of the pandemic when we uh, closed at home and can't uh, work uh, in the studios and um, different artists uh, search the opportunity uh, online and digital artists uh, become like big 
community, a big group of uh, crypto art Ukraine, and they collect around the um, interest of the new marketplace through the NFT. You know what is NFT, yes? But uh, um, other artists, uh, it's not who create the collectibles, some card or gift of specs. It's people who have a um, very nice um, artistic background and they try to use the marketplace for sharing, for earning the money. And in the pandemic time, it just start like educational program because some people just try to uh, try different opportunities and share experience how it happened and then start the war. We become the um, a very big community who sharing the, not just information how to earn the money, they share the money um, middle it, uh, each other. We share the money for people who need the evacuation. We share the, um, <coughs> we just organize the um, Twitter spaces for speak, for talk about the, how are you? And it was very helpful for people because in this um, community we had more than 1,000 people around the Ukraine and somebody now in abroad, but we still have the communication and we still help each other. And in the, um, maybe in the second or third months after start of war, we received the money from the Europe Culture Foundation and we can to help for develop this community. And we um, uh, hired the psychologist, psychotherapist for, for this community. We hired the um, English teacher and marketing um, ex experts who can help to develop the, with um, each artist and group of artists and the whole community to develop. We had a small uh, grants for people who need just some money for food or for evacuation, or for some some medicine, and they had a, a bigger, little bigger grant for people who lost the tools for creating a digital. Uh, it's mean it's some computers who they live at home when they had uh, some urgent uh, evacuation, and this uh, in this case I understand what is most important. What we create the educational program and put on. Uh, <coughs> on YouTube, like open um, courses for other artists. And uh, in my previous experience, I understand what best practice for make the networking, networking for mid middle the people, because uh, mostly artists is very individual, individual practice, yes, and, but if we have some uh, challenges or some, some, some big problem, yes, we have the opportunity to be a solidar each other, yes, and help each other. And I think what for create some networking middle of the people who can to be a solidar have the solidarity each other, yes, we it's a, a great to to this uh, to organize a networking weekends, hackathons, training, social impact project, meetups, uh, rescue team. What is rescue team? It's when somebody uh, feel themselves more um, maybe have them more information about something and can share it, it's a, it's a great. And have the, some group activities. Um, my experience is in UK. I back to, to, to my last half year, what I spent here in UK. Um, I was invited to the D6 uh, Culture in Transit to, to Newcastle, like the curator in residency for half a year at the program Artist at Risk. And at this half a year, I understand what it's very nice when artists who come um, came from Ukraine um, involved in some project uh, when they had uh, some program. They have uh, always the organization who helped them to understand this um, condition. What uh, what happened now in art uh, project on, in, in art life in art field in in the country. Uh, I was. Um, um, Yes, uh, it's where my location. It's uh, uh, northeast, north, north Northumberland, and I live at a small city, a small town. It's Hexham, uh, and it's not far from the Newcastle where I have the project. Newcastle, a beautiful place. I think what most most of you know uh, this this city, and if not, I invite you to the uh, next November to the open the exhibition of program. What I was involved in the regrounding. It's a regrounding, um, as Tatiana present the uh, project, um, it's like the program, Ukrainian uh, British project. 
and at one of the, uh, this project was regrounding. It's a collaboration D6 and Isolatia Ukrainian um, uh, Culture Foundation, and it was um, this program was designed before before the war, and uh, this program must be happened in in Ukraine, in Solidar, in Donetsk region. And um, after the start of war, we are, um, the uh, organizer understand that they must rebuild, redesign this program and involve Ukrainian artists to to UK. Alexandra Krikovska and Karolina Uskakovich, it's uh, two artists who become the uh, winners of this uh, competition. And they both uh, now uh, present here, uh, like Ukrainian experience, and collect here the experience of UK. This program was not because Ukraine and because now we all help Ukrainians. It's, uh, it was um, designed like the program for um, work together. Um, two organizations who had the same um, or similar, not same, the similar um, context. And it's about the... Um, Sorry, it's about the um, uh, mining industry. Yes, it's it's the same uh, problem. Not, not problem now. It's problem because we talk about the uh, some ecological um, problem what we have in the um, like a result of this. But uh, I mean, what we had uh, some heritage and we must, we have something what we can use to the thinking about the future and don't forget about this. It's about the uh, acknowledge uh, ecological, uh, like um, traditional ecological knowledge. It's about uh, working with um, soil, with ground, yes. And it's about the uh, use the ground like the, for industry, yes. And the both sides of this project um, <clears throat> will be presented in the uh, final exhibition in November in Newcastle. And I hope we, had a we will have the presentation in London, maybe uh, with help of um, Ukrainian Institute. Yes, and we had a um, uh, communication, because um, D6, uh, they have a big um, community artists, artists at risk who live in Newcastle, and we had a... Um, it was a master class with making the magic making of dumplings. You know, it's a Ukrainian varenike. Uh, and, we, and then uh, we make this um, master class. We collect the people from around the world who live now in, in Newcastle. And in one of the big projects what, uh, what, what run now in Newcastle, it's a, a city of century um, and for different people who serve some place for living from around the world. Um, in Hexen, I had a small group of 10 people. It's a creative people. From uh, them, we had uh, some communication. We organized a um, uh, festival, small festival of Ukrainian traditions at the Malanka. And uh, we uh, created to, together with a um, local uh, choir. It's a Hexen choir. It was um, amazing uh, practice when uh, British choir sing the Ukrainian songs. It was amazing. Uh, really, it's very sensitive for Ukrainians who, who understand. It it's, was very nice. And I, I have made a small survey from the artists. Very easy, very simple uh, survey. What you like here, what you, where you stay here, and what you need. And uh, the most condition after this survey, I understand what for um, nice collaboration and for support Ukrainian creatives, people who live here in UK, maybe it's not just for Ukrainians, it's for all people who come to, to other countries and haven't, no, in, in, haven't enough um, dive into the context. They need the space. It means some place where they can to come and sit. It means when to meet the other people. And base organization, or many organizations, because organization can help to understand how happened uh, uh, some, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, how, how, uh, what happened around and uh, which opportunity these uh, people have. And digital platform for, for communication and information. It's because we have the new technology and we must use this. And I think it's very easy to communicate around the countries, not just in the, in the some place or, or all organization. 
uh, a place for presentation. It means exhibition reviews and publications. It means what it's nice when uh, artists have them um, like small promotion, yes, to become the visible uh, in the other countries. And I think what um, presentation and different art projects mostly important to have it together with local artists, not just people who come to other countries, not separate them from the uh, local community. It's, <coughs> I think it's more interesting. And it's all, I sorry what, what I rely a little bit for <laughs> my finishing. Thank you, thank you Alicia, Rafaela and, um, Rafaela and Sana. Uh, j just free name what I put here because when I prepared my um, presentation I uh, know, don't know no, uh, any, any participant of this uh, um, Centrala project and I thank you all for this incredible opportunity to talk about a very important topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ludmilla. So next uh, we have Maria Proshkovska who's joining us via Zoom. So hopefully she's going to appear shortly. And Maria, we hope you've been able to see us um, and have you been able to hear Ludmilla well? Uh, we, can't, we can't hear you so far, I see that you're speaking. Uh, I don't think you're muted. Maybe there's an issue with the speaker? Yeah, we, we can't hear you for the moment, Maria, but I'm sure that we're gonna be able to very soon. Um, just whilst we're working out the sound, I'll just introduce you, Maria. Um, Maria is an artist from Kiev, um, and she's now uh, based in London. Um, her work addresses issues of gender, trauma, self-identification, and feminism. Um, her artworks have been exhibited across Europe and North America and are part of collections at the Sherbenko Art Center in Kiev and the Mambo Museum in Bologna. Um, and her works are also part of private collections in Ukraine um, and internationally. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing about Maria's work um, here in the UK and her experience of working here since last year and hoping that we're gonna be able to hear you shortly, Maria. Yeah, maybe it's worth disconnecting the headphones um, just in case that helps. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, Maria. Maybe you can try taking your head, disconnecting your headphones um, in case. Maybe the microphone is connected to your headphones. I wonder whether it will help if you try not using your headphones. Uh, or go, do you want, would you like to have the microphones? Can you? I think Vlada has maybe just stepped out though. <laughs> yes, we can hear you now. We can hear you now. I, I'm, I'm very sorry about that. I will, if it's okay, I will not then use my headphones. I'm, I'm really sorry. We can hear that. you really well now, Maria. All is good. Perfect. First of all, I thank you all for the invitation and for, for this opportunity to take part uh, and be part of this uh, conference. It's very important for me. And uh, I'm really sorry that I wasn't able to join you in person. And we will talk a bit later. Uh, um, it's because I'm a mother of a schooling boy and uh, it's very difficult for us and for me personally to walk and travel even all over UK because the rules are really stricted and we are unable to miss a school. Um, so yeah, um, thank you. And um, I will not uh, talk a lot about myself because it's possible to find uh, um, in the internet and so on. And thank you for the 
great <laughs> introduction. So I would like, I have a really small presentation because I'm not a cultural manager or, and I don't represent any cultural institution. So I could, uh, I could just share my own personal experience and uh, share some experience of my colleagues and friends that are uh, also temporary um, stay um, in UK now. Mostly um, it's, uh, there are women artists with children um, because we all had to, uh, to save our, <laughs> our children and um, their physical and mental health. Uh, so my presentation is small. Uh, we can start with um, so I, I I would like to uh, to tell what what was uh, what what was what was my life like uh, uh, from the full scale from the first day of full scale invasion we decided to um, to escape I decided to save my son so I escaped first to Prague where our friends offered our uh, for us place to uh, to stay then I got an invitation from Mambo Bologna. Uh, they offered me a special um, a special edition art residency for three months and they offered me a scholarship and opportunity to create the project. So we spent three and a half months in Bologna. I was uh, delighted to, to do that project. It was very important for me. And uh, obviously I can compare that experience with my experience here in UK because uh, in Italy, I was protected by the institution. I was like under this umbrella. I got an incredible experience in networking and actually we continue our um, uh, co-working. So uh, I will do a new project uh, probably this autumn uh, in Bologna as well, a new performance, big performance. So um, after that, I was thinking about uh, some stability for my son because he had to start school this year and uh, I had to um, I had to organize for him like a um, year of stability at least year of stability and uh, fortunately uh, we got an invitation from friends um, our friends friends that um, that wanted to support us via Ukrainian scheme program um, which is um, very helpful for every Ukrainian that uh, want to come to to the United Kingdom because of the war in Ukraine. So we came, we stay not in London, we stay in Ipswich. It's, uh, uh, this is East Anglia, uh, Suffolk. Um, and uh, we stay with a uh, British family. Uh, they are our hosts. And um, uh, it... Uh, it it gives us like a feeling we are protected by a family, but at the same time, um, I see some difficulties for me um, as for artists because I am quite isolated from uh, big cities with um, a lot of cultural initiatives and life. And uh, I don't have any like a kind of studio as I had in, in Kyiv to work and uh, and develop uh, or create new projects. So I I have to say that all advantages of existing program uh, Homes for Ukraine are incredible and uh, we able to have like a bioresidential permit with the right for work uh, so we can work legally and uh, uh, we don't have any travel restrictions. Uh, it means like uh, you can be inside of the UK or you can travel abroad without any rules, like you have to stay um, like 180 days or don't stay. So it's very easy. Uh, we have all schooling uh, opportunities for, for children. We have like a medical insurance. So um, this is covered, but it's not only about uh, artist life. It's like uh, life in general. Um, I really appreciate support and empathy from the British society I got. It's like 100% support for Ukrainians and it really helps to, um, to feel that um, uh, Ukraine is important and the situation is important and 
uh, nobody is forgotten. Um, there are some additional opportunities for artists to work and study in the UK, but uh, I especially um, find some uh, some of it difficult, and I will continue later and explain. Uh, what, for example, um, I may say that my case is probably not very usual because I I I had a despite of the war in this uh, difficult situation and uh, being a refugee, single mother, I got a lot of projects, mostly distant, but uh, there was more than fifteen. Uh, group exhibitions during this uh, period of time and two big solo exhibitions in Italy and in Austria. And I um, took part in a, a Women in Conflict Fellowship program uh, in Scotland last August, uh, which I uh, really was uh, happy to uh, to be a part of because that gave me a, like great networking and uh, like a big power of uh, inspiration um, and uh, I got uh, I got an offer a few weeks ago from the Central St. Martins. I will start my master program from autumn if I will pass successfully IELTS exam. Um, so um, but I know a lot of other cases where when um, other uh, artists, uh, especially with children, were unable to work a lot or to do some something they wanted to because of like difficult life circumstances. And actually, like if I would speak very personally, it's all not easy. It was the hardest year in my life, um, and. Uh, the difficult the most difficult is to plan is the planning the future because you actually don't know if you will stay here or you will come back to ukraine when you will able to come back to ukraine so um next slide i have uh named to survive and not go crazy which is actually true and uh, here i would like to talk about some difficulties that I personally and my friends and colleagues have here uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, so first of all, it's uh, it is very difficult to into uh, to integrate into existing uh, cultural environment because you don't have such a deep uh, connections and networking and roots like you have in Ukraine or where you did work previously and uh, you don't have you don't have any knowledge is how it works here so um, some information or help or support uh, institutional support would be really um, helpful uh, for some artists uh, um, it's difficult to communicate and work because of their uh, lack of the language skills um, I I find found uh, personally um, a, a, a huge information scattering of existing um, British art initiatives. So for me, it's like kind of difficult to um, to find what what's going on and um, uh, what it uh, what uh, initiative or project uh, would be interesting or possible to work with for me personally. Um, I find uh, for, uh, I see the lack of uh, actually uh, communication uh, between Ukrainian artists inside of the UK. So we all are like kind of separated and I try to um, to keep connections on or to build new connections if I know that some uh, some artists from Ukraine came to the United Kingdom. I try to stay in touch. I try to travel and to see them if it's possible. But in general, it's not very easy. And um, my biggest problem, it's a lack of mobility, as I said. That's why I am online today with you, because I am a single mother and uh, nobody can help me with my son. I can ask my uh, our hosts because it's like inconvenient. Uh, babysitters are super uh, expensive, and uh, I have to be mother first, and then I try to 
do what I can do to build my career and to do projects like, you know, it's always the second uh, second position in my list. And um, what, uh, what I can say as well, some of my colleagues and friends, Ukrainian artists, they really uh, need mental um, help and support. And uh, it's it's probably the biggest problem of every refugee and um, every Ukrainian that uh, came to to the UK or other countries because we all have these emotional um, emotional uh, problems and it's it's really it's really difficult and to survive. And in the end, I would like to say the I didn't apply for universal credit or any um, financial support from the government. It was my choice uh, to have some freedom. But I had conversations, a lot of conversations with my colleagues uh, that had to apply because uh, they don't have any support from Ukraine or other um, their families can support them and they have to survive with children as well here. So they had to apply. And the problem with the universal credit is that you have to um, to come every week to this, um, to this job center and to explain what did you, uh, what did you already, um, I don't know, like did for fi to find the job actually. And for contemporary artists, it's especially difficult because if you stay not at like in a big city, like it's a small town or, or village, all they can offer you is like to paint the walls or I don't know, to be a cleaner. And sometimes I know cases where my friends, uh, really successful contemporary artists from Ukraine um, were asked to, to start a job as a cleaner ladies because um, uh, again, uh, lack of uh, language and uh, uh, and impossible to find any other job. So what I was thinking, what to summarize everything I said, I was thinking about what would be useful in this case. So first of all, I I think the concentration of uh, information and possibilities uh, for Ukrainian artists in the UK and one resource i mean it could be like a website or some uh platform or community uh when everybody where everybody can find like a very useful information um i was thinking about the support for ukrainian artists from um from the local uk institution uh, and maybe um some uh, some opportunities for them to do some projects like distant online to do some probably master classes or uh, sharing the experience. So it could be useful uh, for uh, artists to do some projects to have some money or some grants and uh, uh, don't have these uh, problems with universal credit as well because I think it's possible to build a sustainable construction when uh, institution will offer for artists some opportunities to do artistic contemporary or artistic uh, projects or job and to be kind of um, employed. Um, and what I would like to say in the end that uh, that is very important to avoid the, the building a bubble uh, we need to be connected to the local context, to the local art scene. Uh, and it's uh, very important, not only for Ukrainian artists, but I believe that for British culture as well, because uh, we can build these uh, bridges for years and ages, and it can develop uh, both, uh, both cultures. And uh, uh, in the end, I would like to say that um, networking is really important. For example, after the 
Women in Conflict Fellowship, I started to uh, work with uh, um, uh, prof, uh, uh, his, sorry, with Brian Brivati, who is a professor of history, and um, journalist Martin Bright and my ex colleague from Kiev. Uh, so we are working on developing the uh, discussive uh, and debate platform. Um, about uh, Ukrainian-British uh, cultural uh, relationships. So, thank you for your attention. Sorry about the kind of chaotic uh, speech, uh, but uh, I tried to be honest and just to share my personal uh, personal experience. I hope it will be helpful. Thank you so much, Maria. It's definitely been extremely helpful. I probably look like I'm not looking at you in the eye because maybe uh, you're, yeah, but I'm, I'm looking at the screen and we've, um, it's been extremely useful to hear you. We're just sorry that you're not here in person. Um, but Ipswich isn't too far from London. I hope that you might be able to join an event at the Ukrainian Institute London at some point. Um, and yes, um, it was a pleasure. Yeah, um, and you've raised so many important points that I hope we'll get a chance to discuss more today, both as part of the panels, but also um, during the breaks as well. And we'll stay in touch with you, Maria. I, I, I do hope that there will be chance for us, some of us here, to work together on the kind of platform that you're describing, where the opportunities that exist can be consolidated into one place. Um, and, and thank you as well for reminding us about what the day-to-day -day challenges are for you, you know, including childcare, including the, you know, the isolation of where you are because of the sponsors that you're living with and lack of access to the space that you need to be able to work. These are all such important questions. And um, as Tatiana mentioned at the, in her keynote uh, speech at the beginning, it's important for us all to remember what that daily experience is for Ukrainians in Ukraine and also here. Um, there are so many extra challenges that you are all needing to think about beyond how you can actually uh, start your art, artistic work. Um, so congratulations on managing to do 15 projects or however many it is over the past year, as well as managing your childcare and all of the many other challenges. It's very, very impressive. Um, so we'll, we'll have time to to chat more with you, Maria. Um, we're looking forward to asking some more questions, uh, but we'll now go to Vlada Vajayevsky, who uh, is, has, has got their presentation um, to give for us uh, as well. Vlada is a performance artist and researcher from Kyiv um, and the co-convener of Occupy PPV, Perverting the Power Vertical Politics and Aesthetics, which we're looking forward to learning more about today. Um, and together with PPV, Vlada has worked on various events, bringing together artists, academics, and activists to platform anti-fascist and anti-authoritarian voices. Um, and Vlada will tell us more about some of these projects today. Um, and in Vlada's performance art, a key focus uh, is exploring queer history, Ukrainian queer history. Uh, and together with Dvichka, um, Vlada has published an anthology, Queer Ukraine LGBTQ Plus Voices During Wartime, which uh, just came out in February this year. So please do take a look at that as well. And over to you, Vlada. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, thanks. So first and foremost, thank you so much for having me. And um, I think it was very important to begin centering um, voices how we did, um, voices that are at risk and voices that had to be forcefully relocated. I'm going to be talking a little bit about a different aspect of Ukrainian culture, just about the less institutional and more grassroots diasporic communities, um, because um, while we should be centering first and foremost um, those of us from the cultural communities that had to be forcefully relocated because of Russia's full-scale invasion, there's also a really big community forming um, on the peripheries of Ukrainian art sector, and that's the diaspora uh, that has been present here for a little bit longer and that right now is mixing in with all of the refugees, and I'm going to be just talking about how that's forming in London within my own context. And while I am a part of the lovely uh, initiative of Occupy PPV, I'm not kind of representing any institution, so I'm just going to be talking to you more about certain uh, grassroots just initiatives that spring up and that are immediate and that are 
um, that don't have the time to go through an institutional setting, and that means that usually they're not as well funded and are a little bit more precarious, but still, I think they deserve a little bit of a spotlight. Oh, this is quite fast. Okay. Um, so first, I'll just talk through a, a little bit of how the diaspora and those of us who um, relocated to London responded um, to the full-scale invasion and to all of the fundraising and organizational aspect that came with being in a diaspora and being within the solidarity networks uh, that we established. Um, so in my own context, um, I was quite uh, shocked by the amount of hostility actually that was present in the institutional setting because I'm a part of Goldsmith University of London and most of my experience comes from there. Um, and while a lot of support has been given to Ukrainian cultural workers, if we're talking about the cultural academic sphere, um, I wouldn't say that that's the case as well. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is so, mostly because of the Russocentric academia and the lack in uh, decolonial efforts from the British and Western academic sphere. Um, but these are just some of the things that like people like myself in the diaspora worked on, and these are, uh, for example, we did a very uh, fast, this was April 8th, fundraiser for Ukraine, where we worked with local communities in South Bermondsey, where I was located, and um, spotlighted artists from Eastern Europe and uh, from the UK uh, in an effort to fundraise. And again, because we don't have funding for most of these things, these are all uh, community events where you go to a let's say a cafe that is running um, a community um, platform and you talk to them and if they give you the space, then they give you the space. If not, then you have to try again. So it's very kind of last minute immediate efforts, but this was one of them. Then this uh, Ukrainian community kitchen um, is one of the events that was done by Sesvit, which is um, a wonderful collective that is formed by two people, one from the Ukrainian diaspora, one from the Lithuanian diaspora, and actually they are very good at um, the aspect of solidarity and combining many different people from our region, quote unquote, in an attempt to fundraise for Ukraine, but also uh, to bring a sort of sense of a community to the Eastern European diaspora that's present in London, and I think a lot of these kind of methods that these people and like our communities use are and could be very helpful to integrate um, artists at risks and people who are still newly coming into the UK, uh, but more on that a little bit later. And this is a little performance poetry and film festival that we did, again, very last minute. It was organized by um, a few people and it's always kind of based on solidarity. You ask, for example, a friend if they can perform for you, you don't have any money. If they say yes, then they say yes and you form links of uh, solidarity in this way. Unfortunately, uh, not all of us have access to institutional settings and spaces, uh, but this is, I think, where most of the quote-unquote solidarity actually takes place, is in spaces that don't have the same resources, but it's kind of People, a lot of these spaces have people who have experience in war and conflict. Um, we've collaborated a lot with communities, um, not just Bosnian communities, not just communities from our region, but also we've worked a lot with the Iranian diaspora, with the Palestinian diaspora. Uh, we've worked a lot with other communities that understand the immediacy of having to fundraise without the resources. And um, I think that's something that we should be trying to do more so going forwards because while right now it's really important to center Ukrainian voices because the amount of erasure that we're going through is quite something and uh, every single day um, our country is still being destroyed, people are still losing their lives, but there's a lot of um, points of connection that we can find if we start reaching out um, to people and collaborating with them face to face and it's not about Sometimes it's not about institutional help because it takes forever. Sometimes it's just about being present in a space uh, where some community is organizing and just having a conversation with them if you're able to do that. And that's how links of solidarity are built. Um, then the last little example um, is a very, uh, 
very urgent fundraiser that we had to do that I put on with the help of a few people uh, and that I'm going to expand upon in the next slide. But basically, uh, just to give you an example of how we operate uh, within the diaspora in London, um, in this case, I got a request from my best friend who's on the front lines um, on a Wednesday um, to say that, hey, like we need this, this, and that. Um, Wednesday, Thursday, you work, uh, you write everything up. On Friday, you're having the fundraiser. And it's these kind of events that are extremely immediate that wouldn't be possible without links of solidarity that we have been establishing throughout the past year. And we've put it on, thankfully, to one wonderful community, one community library in Peckham, in London, Bibliotheca Kyiv. Um, and they were very thankful and provided, I mean, very helpful and provided a space for us. And it's these tiny spaces that are extremely important when it comes to immediate fundraising because, again, unfortunately, sometimes institutions take forever with the bureaucratic aspect that's present in that. Um, but more a little bit on kind of the activist practice that we have developed with friends. Um, in London, it's about publishing as a tool of support. Unfortunately, you can't see that. But I'm borrowing this term from a wonderful collective uh, under structures uh, that operates in Ukraine, in and out of Ukraine. But right now, um, they're working on humanitarian aid to Kherson, and they're mostly based in Kherson. Um, but they, in the very beginning, it was the most immediate publication, DIY publication I've ever seen. Uh, in the first two months, um, they have managed to create a book called Oberich, where they collected um, all of the things that protect the Ukrainian creative community in Ukraine. And it was pictures and texts of everything that you take with you if you have to leave your home, this one thing that protects you. Um, and with this publication, they managed uh, to raise a whole lot of money for um, both humanitarian efforts, but also for the military. And I kind of looked at that as an example of using my skills of translation, editing, writing and seeing how I can apply that to organizational and activist circles. And we, um, with my brother, um, as part of a Dvika collective, then started working on um, a book um, centering um, queer Ukrainian voices during wartime because, um, while it is important to talk about Ukraine in general and every Ukrainian as a unified entity, it is also important to focus on voices that are a little bit more marginal. Um, and especially uh, when it comes to Russian colonialism that has always been homophobic and transphobic by nature, uh, we wanted to uh, look at the state of queerness in wartime and see if we can provide a platform for these people to share um, their experiences and the things that they cannot share openly in public sometimes because um, there's not as much support, unfortunately, as I'm sure there will be in the future, and it's just going to take time um, for an open dialogue of sorts. So we, in the diaspora, that we had more resources, we had more safety, we were not uh, getting shelled constantly. We thought that one of the things we can do is archive and actively have this conversation of the state of things of our community back home, but also abroad. Um, and with this book that came out in February, um, we're also doing a similar thing that Oberich and other structures were doing, where uh, we're reaching out to everyone we can, um, and we're doing book presentations that are fully fundraising. This book is a fully charity book. Um, every sale that we kind of, every amount of money that we get from sales, we send to uh, Insight, a wonderful LGBTQ plus charity in Ukraine, but also other charities that work with bringing in um, much needed hormones for the queer community that is both fighting actively on the front lines, but also that's volunteering or just trying to survive. Uh, so this is one of the methods of solidarity that we kind of, a solidarity platform, a network that we developed, and it's become quite trans-diasporic, where like people from all over uh, our region, but also from other parts of the world, are collaborating together to get something to a community in need, and I think that's quite beautiful. And I'll talk a little bit about that going forward. Um, yeah, these are just some examples of um, how we did things. Um, this was in a wonderful, um, another diasporic activist center in Warsaw, um, Sonishnik uh, SDK, that works um, for years now on um, culture, 
um, of migrants into like in Poland and kind of spotlighting um, voices from the Caucasus, voices from Ukraine, voices that had to resettle because of war, but also that came there to seek work. Uh, and their solidarity center is, like the methodology that they use there is something that I aspire to see in the UK. Um, they work as a part of institution, but they're not completely tied to that institution and they have some sort of freedom to uh, spotlight the things and do the things that they see just. And every single day since the full-scale invasion, they have been um, working really hard on both humanitarian and military aid. Um, but moving on. I wanted to quickly talk about a good example of institutional support to Ukrainian um, artists, and not solely Ukrainian artists, but artists from uh, other parts of our regions as well. Um, and this was an event that was held at Cell Project Space in Bethnal Green in London, um, curated by um, wonderful Adamas Narcevichus. I hope I'm saying the surname right. Um, but um, Adamas, kind of, we were talking about it for quite a while. Um, and usually what happens, unfortunately, even though people have uh, help in mind and support in mind, sometimes it can, sometimes certain institutions, even though they want to platform and support uh, our communities, uh, it ends up being so that they talk over our communities. And what happened here, which was very different, and which I want, would love to see more of in general in the cultural sphere in UK, is that Adomas, every, every single choice was run by members of our community. The charities were established by us. Um, the kind of event was, everything was going through us, but also it wasn't solely like based on what we said. It was a community experience of like, communal organizing, where an institution gives you their power and their space to and trusts you to do the right thing. And I think that's something that we should be seeing more of, where it's not just institutions inviting artists one time or just programming everything and then inviting someone to speak at that program, but it's about kind of giving away the institutional power to those who you want to center. It's about centering people who are actively going through erasure and through experiences of oppression and letting them and trusting them to actually do the right thing because they will and because they know best what's best for their community. Um, so this is just one example that I wanted to quickly bring before going into talking about what we do as kind of a creative academic practice. Also, I think it would be of interest to many of you here, CEL is uh, starting um, a Central and Eastern European uh, feminist reading circle um, that you can uh, work from online and also in person. I think it would be great for our colleagues uh, from Ukraine as well to kind of get into the diasporic networks uh, uh, in the cultural sphere. Um, and it could be a very interesting thing going forward. But anyways, now I'll talk a little bit more about our main practice. Um, so it's Occupy PPV, and you can read some of the information here. Unfortunately, my colleague Daria Nosova wasn't able to join. Um, she is uh, curating an exhibition now in London about um, female artists from um, the south of Ukraine. And it's a wonderful exhibition if you can go check it out. Um, but anyhow, um, I'm going to be honest with you, I was never looking forward to working in an institutional setting. I never thought I'm going to go into that. Uh, but um, seeing how Russo-centric academia was based on my experience and also how much of the capital on Eastern European culture and art was held by Russian institutions and Russian artists, it was quite infuriating because I saw the amount of refugees that are coming in from Ukraine and there was just no possibility of um, kind of taking that capital away from them if you don't do it on an institutional level. So thankfully Dasha uh, started her PhD at School of Slavonic and Eastern European uh, Studies in UCL and we got the connections through that. Um, and we saw a wonderful seminar series called PPV that was run there from 2018, but it was run by um, two Russian academics and one Polish academic, um, which which was a little bit um, confusing for us because the 
lecture series said that it was perverting the power vertical of the academics ecology in uh, the UK, but we saw that it wasn't perverting anything after all. It was simply providing, um, taking away the hegemonic Western um, <laughs> kind of capital away from like British academia and putting it onto Russian alternative voices. And we just thought that you're just platforming another form of non-Western imperialism. So we, uh, in a way, wrote a giant email to one of the conveners, and thankfully, um, Michal Muraski uh, has been, throughout the whole process of uh, dealing with full-scale invasion, very supportive. Um, and we said that, look, um, as things are currently, we don't think that PPV should be running the way that it has been running all these years, because uh, we think that we should be platforming voices that are on the peripheries of our region and not actually the ones that uh, are the power vertical of the region, are on the very top. Um, and that's something that we did with Occupy PPV, where in, we did that in October 2022, and since then we ran a few events on um, platforming um, anti-fascist and anti-authoritarian Ukrainian uh, voices that don't get as much of a platform, um, and uh, we fundraised for uh, certain units that, again, don't get as much of institutional uh, and government support, but that are still fighting for Ukraine and need that support. So that was our main area of focus. Then we kind of looked into the question of pacifism femin within feminist discourse and invited Iranian colleagues, colleagues from Bosnia, uh, colleagues from Ukraine and uh, the UK, and we had a discussion all together and a about how feminism can go beyond uh, the current stance of pacifism because um, there's been a lot of wonderful articles written by colleagues from Ukraine, for example, Darya Tsimbaluk, on um, topics of how feminism right now should not be pacifist in the slightest, and that pacifism in, feminis in feminism erases completely the struggle um, of our female soldiers, of everyone who's currently resisting the Russian aggression weapon in hand, but they're still feminist. And the fact that they have a weapon in hand does not negate the fact that they're feminist. And we tried to start a conversation to have links of solidarity between other um, diasporas and feminist circles saying like, we still value the same things as you do, but just not through the prism of pacifism and we problematized it anyhow. Um, we later looked at anti-fascist architecture and the way that Russia uses architecture um, to kind of um, spread their dominant ideology uh, and other things. Of course, we're going to be still platforming things on queer liberation, uh, Eastern European queer voices. We also problematize the topic of uh, kind of East European uh, discourse in the UK, as I said before, that it's very Russo-centric. But I just wanted to end, um, sorry that I'm taking so long, very quickly on topics of visibility and accessibility. Um, we have gotten a lot of help and support, which I'm extremely thankful for. Um, and especially, this is great for all of our refugees coming in and all of the artists at risk coming in. They need it more than ever and more than anyone else. But um, it has also been uh, quite tough to see uh, how many attempts there are, even from members uh, within our region, from uh, other folks uh, that are Eastern European academics, cultural workers. Um, how little people actually want to hear what we have to say uh, sometimes. Um, because certain people will still try to educate you on what you should do in certain environments. And while we should be learning from other experiences of conflict and post-conflict, uh, it is important to know that every single conflict and every single war is still a very different subjective experience. And while we're extremely open um, to these dialogues, uh, it would be great to see our colleagues um, actually hear from us and listen to us sincerely and not just giving us a platform to talk and then completely negating what we've said. Um, yeah, and I guess with that, uh, I'm going to end for now, but I'm looking forward to the conversation. And thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Vlada, and hopefully we can get Maria back on the screen. Um, and I'm, I'm aware of time, so I think maybe I'll just ask one question and then we can um, have questions from the floor. Um, 
I would like to come back to the kind of focus of this panel, which is about what kind of platforms um, we should be aiming towards and, and also how we can be developing the solidarity between um, Ukrainians and, um, and other creatives from Central and Eastern Europe. And so I, I would like to come back to the three of you to ask um, more on your thoughts on this. And of course, we're here at Centrala who have been doing such fantastic work for many years in platforming voices from Central and Eastern Europe. And, um, and there's definitely a lot uh, that can be shared uh, from, I'm sure, many of, of many of you who are here about the networks and platforms that already exist for artists from this region. Um, but I, I also was very aware of um, some of the points that Maria made about the, you know, the very specific um, challenges that displaced Ukrainians um, have in the UK. And actually, a lot of the time, it's the, like you were mentioning, Maria, the, the kind of daily life, daily challenges are quite different. And you mentioned the, the need for um, mental and emotional support as well. Um, so I just wanted to ask a bit more about your experience since being... Well, for all of you, Maria um, and Ludmilla from the past year, maybe the experience you've had of, of working with other creatives from Central and East um, Europe and, and, um, and how you imagine a platform could work that was both about opportunities for Ukrainians and displaced Ukrainians and also um, what shared experiences there, there are between you as Ukrainians and others from Central and East Europe. And, and how you see those coming together, because I'm. I think that there are some things that are specific for Ukrainians and the, dis the experience of displacement through the war, and other experience for migrant creatives, where there's a lot of shared experiences, but maybe some areas where it's not shared. So I wonder what you will think about the need for Ukrainian-specific initiatives and platforms, and um, platforms working together uh, between Ukrainians and, um, and creators from other Eastern uh, and Central European countries. I don't know who might like to comment on that first. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, it, um, in my own opinion, I, I see this um, platform. Platform is uh, like some abstractive narrative. It's mean what I see this in the different like in different level and uh, first level it's for me it's very important to connect ukrainians who are abroad because like diaspora and all those people who uh, just uh, come to to other countries they feel themselves safety then they join to some uh, part of some community yes and uh, yes, of course, the um, um, program Home for Ukraine, incredible for like usual um, um, needing for, for, for people, yes. But if you join to some bubble with people who uh, think like you, it's very important because I know that many artists who live in, in uh, small, small uh, towns like me, uh, it's easily to c be connect with uh, creative people because you have the like s similar language. It's easily to talk with them about your experience and sharing something very important for them too. And it's mean with this bubble, with like the first level, it's very important to have the connection middle the artist and middle the creative people who come to the UK. But next level, it's uh, oh, uh, it's just about the uh, become the artist and abroad it's like uh, to uh, make to to not stop your uh, your experience your your practices uh, when you come to abroad you must uh, uh, become like person who had the ability to join to all what uh, what happened in the this country and in this level it's not enough just collect the Ukrainian artists in one platform. It's very important to have some um, platform, like some basis, basic uh, organization. Uh, some who have the experience have to work with many, a huge number of people, with community. And uh, it's, um, I think what, what many organizations can do, do this together or some organization can take this role for themselves and do something. And I talk about this, what, presentation, a level to uh, like uh, 
provide some art practices to other uh, for, for in new countries. It's very important to have the collaboration with the local artists. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, Maria. Uh, yes, I absolutely agree uh, that the most important thing is not, uh, as I uh, already said, and uh, Lucy already said, is not to create a bubble, because uh, um, we can uh, we can organize the uh, basic uh, support, like uh, I mean, safe sky home and some money for surviving, but for normalization of life, it's necessary to continue um, continue the art practice, con continue the projects, or to uh, create new projects that you um, that you have to do as an artist. It's, it's your work, and uh, I I I really believe that the most important thing is the um, is to find the way the way for collaborations to find the way for networking and to find a way for this intercultural um, uh, intercultural um, communication that will build uh, new incredible results. And uh, uh, I see a lot of, uh, like from my uh, personal, um, again, artistic practice, I see a lot of projects that try to highlight uh, Ukrainian art abroad uh, and in the UK as well to to make a, like a group exhibitions or personal exhibitions. But I um, I think that the most important thing for now. So we have this year of uh, of um, working in this way. But for now, it's very important to create like a, a local connections um, uh, to. Um, start working with the local communities to find new collaborations to um, to try make a research in a local context and local culture and that will help to integrate Ukrainian artists in a local community and uh, I would not uh, separate like you know, Ukrainian artists from other artists that came from other countries abroad, I mean, uh, to the United Kingdom or activists, because uh, my experience from the fellowship program um, is that we all understand together and we had incredible artists from Yemen, from uh, Sri Lanka, from Afghanistan, you know, some of them uh, live here uh, temporarily, some of them are settled, some of them just came for the fellowship, but anyway, it helped uh, us to understand problems of each other and to create new incredible projects. So, yeah, um, I am... Thank you, thank you, Maria. And um, I'm sure we'll speak more about it today, but of course, um, there are so many shared experiences of Ukrainians and Central East Europeans over history and uh, shared experiences of Russian aggression. And then also so many parallels to be drawn. Um, Vlada was speaking earlier about work with um, Iranian and Palestinian activists as well, right? So this solidarity working together on the same cause um, and, and not staying the bu in the bubble is definitely very important. Um, Vlada, would you like to add anything? Yeah, sure, just a tiny thing. I completely agree with what both of my colleagues have said. Um, and it's like, it's very important to have that aspect of kind of getting um, Ukrainian um, artists into local communities. Um, and kind of, as you said also, uh, the fact that a lot of us here have the same shared history in one way or another, even though it's still quite different experiences. And of course, many Ukrainians who are coming here now are coming here because of the most contemporary Russia's invasion in Ukraine. But we, institutions can provide spaces to talk about our shared history. That would be something that would be extremely interested because there is such a big and growing migrant community from uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and it's hard for people outside of institutions to establish those links. So it would be great to see more of a push on an institutional level to bring in all of these different perspectives and experiences and that could create uh, new projects, new work, new collaboration, but also just very quickly, um, another thing that would be great to see, and this is solely based on my experience and the people that I 
collaborate with and do work with in London, uh, is that I'm aware that there's already certain platforms for uh, sharing of dialogue uh, for Eastern uh, European academics, cultural workers, but they're not accessible to Ukrainians. Uh, and they're not accessible to Ukrainians because of certain institutes and places where they take place. Um, and this is about, again, listening to us and trusting us in a way that we want to collaborate. Like, and again, this is a London perspective, right? We want to collaborate with a lot of the uh, other cultural workers from Eastern Europe. But when they're hosted by places such as Pushkin House, for example, it just simply does not allow Ukrainian workers to come into that space. It absolutely stops you from even trying to establish any links of solidarity because it's an institution that represents a state that is committing active erasure of everything Ukrainian, everything uh, on our land. So it would be great to also see a kind of willingness to pull away from that in the name of solidarity from certain colleagues of ours to establish new links of solidarity and new communities and new uh, initiatives and institutions. That's another little thing, I guess. Uh, thank you, uh, Vlada. I, I think now we don't have so much time left, so please, uh, we look forward to comments and questions um, from all of the participants. And I'll just pass the microphone around. Hi. Um, it's been really inspirational so far, by the way. Thank you very much for all the presentations and all the experiences that you've, uh, you've all shared. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, prior to the um, uh, Russian aggression, what was the um, diaspora, Ukrainian diaspora in the UK? Do you have any numbers? Do you have any idea um, how many um, Ukrainians were living or established in the UK? It's the first one um, question, sorry. And the second one, um, based on the questions and the conversation so far, uh, especially on the last point about uh, pulling out of those uh, Russian-influenced institutions. Who do you think, or how can that be done, um, and how can everybody contribute to that? Uh, I feel I should really know the numbers of the Ukrainian yeah. diaspora. Uh, what I do know for sure is that it's difficult to to have a figure for it. I don't know, Vlada, maybe you, you might... Yeah, no, I don't know... Um, I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, there, there has been a figure that has been, I've heard several times, but also it's always been caveated by the fact that no one's quite sure because people move in. There are also some un undocumented people as well. And, um, it, but it's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I would have to get my phone out and Google it, <laughs> um, but I'm not sure. But um, on the second point, um, would any of you like uh, to comment? Vlada, maybe? I, mean, I can start and maybe someone else yeah, wants to follow sure. up. Um, it's a very interesting question because, again, these spaces have been established for a really long time, and they're some of the only places, I guess, that support financially a lot of the workers from Eastern Europe, and that's why it's really hard to pull away from them because they've established um, a sort of need for them to be there in the first place. Um, and it's about, in a way, um, I guess, it's, it's comfort. It's um, something that a lot of like our colleagues in London are used to is these certain spaces, but um, <laughs> it's about making and creating, I guess, I, I, it's a not, I'm not gonna say making a different institution uh, because I mean, like none of us from the community have the resources to do that. Um, if someone else does, that's great. Maybe we can collaborate on something like that. But um, I can't give you an alternative but I can just say this, that in the name of true, in the name of true solidarity with people who are facing extinction currently, um, the first thing to do is step away from those influences and then we can all together come up with what to do from then. And then again, there's a lot of many different smaller initiatives that are popping up right now that are, um, for example, the Kupala festival that has been going on for a long time. There's something springing out of there where there is um, Romanian, Ukrainian, um, Lithuanian, and artists from other diasporas who are currently just meeting and talking about the colonial aspects of uh, our region and what that means. And there's these tiny little communities. Somehow it would be lovely to organize them all together. I have no idea how. It's quite tough. But first things first, in my eyes, it's just about going away from that influence, which will allow for space 
uh, for new spaces to be established and for new links of solidarity and for new collaboration and work. Um. Maria Ludmilla, would you like to add anything? Um, I, I, this question just reminds me about um, my experience when uh, maybe it's after three or five months uh, after the start of war, the Goethe Institute uh, invite um, Ukrainian creatives and crea creative manager to um, like the online uh, uh, online um, I don't know it's tour uh, in Ukraine to Ukraine yes and it was uh, invited the um, uh, people from Germany and a um, few uh, managers uh, like propose us to join to the project to collaborate with the Ukrainian and Russian um, choir or some symphonic orchestra, and it was uh, it's 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 like um, I think what yes of course from the outside it looks like they must do something to make the peace middle the different countries, but you don't have in mind how it pain to feel it when you're inside the country. And if I hear the name of some institution uh, what um, established of Russians, it's not me now when and some previous history, sorry, now it's just pain. And uh, maybe it's a um, good idea to start the not a very big institution because I understand what uh, Ukraine now not can, haven't money to put to some establish some institution around around the world, but we can to start to build the community because online it's more cheaper. It's not so expensive. Have made some uh, some uh, venue and uh, made the, some team and Ukrainians who work in Ukraine after the Maidan. It's mostly work the like volunteer and they can to create these communities around the uh, world and it's it's possible and we can to uh, invite people to become I don't know put few hours in the in the in the day or in the week to have something important to develop their online platform. It's, it's uh, like an <laughs> online institution, I don't know. I think it's, it's possible. Now they have enough uh, tools for this. Maria, would you like to add anything? Yes, um, uh, as I am online, I just used the possibility to uh, use the Google and to answer the first question, uh, which will summarize as well. So um, for 2021, uh, the United Kingdom was less than 40,000 of Ukrainians that were born in Ukraine first. Uh, and for now, it's around 1,000 um, uh, 160,000 Ukrainians that stay in the UK and uh, 200,000 visas were approved. So it's kind of big community that is necessary to do something with and to integrate into the uh, British society as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, we need one. Okay, yeah. We're out of time. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, I hope we can stay in touch. It's such a shame not to get to chat with you now over a cup of tea. Um, but thank you so much for joining. And thank you, Ludmilla and Vlada. And um, we're looking forward to discussing all of these questions more with everyone um, over the rest of the day. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much, panelist and uh, Maria, for uh, facilitating it. Um, we're now going to have 15 minutes uh, coffee break, and we're going to uh, come back uh, at 12 uh, for the second panel.
Yes. everyone. I hope it was a bit of a shorter break than planned. I hope everybody feels suitably refreshed um, and replenished. Um, so we are on to our second panel for today. Um, I'm going to be moderating it and please bear with me because it is my first official moderation of an event like this and speakers like this. So I'm, I'm finding my feet. Uh, my name is Tina Hoffman and I am foremostly an independent artist, Croatian born. Um, I am uh, also a PhD researcher researching into representation of Eastern Europeans in British cultural institutions, which is a vast subject <laughs> and I need to find ways of squeezing it. But um, as a part of that, I spend uh, time at Centrala collaborating with Centrala on my research. Um, so second, <clears throat> excuse me, second panel is uh, basically opening a dialogue around how can we best utilize the knowledge we already have from the past responses to conflict, displacement and refugee crisis from UK's creative sector. And I think it will be a really, really good um, and interesting way after uh, the ending of the last panel to kind of gently continue into seeing what experiences already are there. And by that, I immediately want to refer to, to Vlada's um, point that they offered to us. Um, in, in no way are we neglecting the specificity of each conflict and response to each conflict, because of course, after all, we are talking about unique human individual experiences, if nothing else. So, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker to start with, and that is Dr. Nela Milic, who is a senior researcher, lecturer, artist, and consultant with more than 25 years' experience managing and executing projects with artists, academics, journalists, and community groups. Throughout her career, Nella has delivered creative projects for organizations including the Royal Opera House, Barbican Arts Council England, John Lewis, Al Jazeera, Campbell Works, and so on. Uh, Nella ran Refugees and the Arts Initiative, a British national organ organization for the refugee arts, and her work has been displayed at the Olympic Stadium in London. Nella is interested in the intersection of time and space, which has brought her to many multimedia and mapping projects where she's dealt with memory, digital archives, cultural activism, city participation, and East European art. And I am now going to assume the role of Nella's participant, so um, excuse me whilst I change my scripts. Nella, the floor is yours. Thank you. So thanks everybody for coming. Um, in this presentation, I will have two narratives, uh, visual and textual, and the two voices representing my two tongues. Amanda Coffey asserts that the fieldwork is personal, 
emotional and identity work in which ethnographers ought to reflect on the production of the self. This practice, in her view, differs according to the discipline, and I'm inspired by that departure from anthropology to turn the lens inwards and question the researcher during the process of investigation. Balkanizing the established taxonomy I wrote about in 2008 in the project with the same name, Balkanizing Taxonomy. I grew up in Belgrade, once capital of Yugoslavia, a country that disappeared and in its place now is a cluster of individual states. So when I go back now, I go to Belgrade, center of Serbia. Many are nostalgic about that history because the Socialist Federative Republic of Yugoslavia had core values that were for the envy of numerous democratic countries who struggled to uphold them. Those paradigms of brotherhood, unity, and equality were encouraged by the state, and people mainly supported them because it made their sense of self, as well as of their country, great. Even though it was propagated and idealized according to the Communist Party that governed the nation for four decades, this realm of communal life was keeping most of the people socially secure by providing education, jobs, and holidays. Yugoslavs were non-aligned, trading internationally and traveling the world. It all changed in the 90s when I went into exile, and this is the first record of its stark impact on my work. For six years that I could not go back home, I could not remember my mother's face, which was the greatest loss I had from that experience. This photo of myself taken by a friend later on revealed that I very much look like her, and as I stand in front of the mirror, I should have been able to see her for all that time. I could not remember her. With the wars that divided Yugoslavia, Western, mostly European and American peacekeepers, moved in with military charity and government organizations that were profiting from the war whilst behaving as they were introducing the civilization to the area. Dismantled Yugoslav principles that held it together, felt mocked, and the Western ones came with a price. What was left from the state funds got poured into maintaining the relationship with the world. That global interaction, without the ability to immediately mend the local one due to the eroded neighborly ties, left now independent states of Yugoslavia in the status of colonies, from which the resources are drawn, transported across the borders, and utilized abroad. I left the burning country when it was bombed by NATO, not devastated by the Croatian or Bosnian army. What survived the fire was then taken away by the cosmopolitans. I did not know what to grieve first, the people, the land, or the future carved by the Western folk. Fanon recognizes that the quest for national culture prior to the colonial era can be justified by the colonized intellectual's interest in stepping back and observing the Western culture, which they could be wrapped by. Us, who are involved in passionate research and intensive study, as Fanon defines the many autoethnographies conducted by people feeling robbed of their own past through the process of colonization, are producing identity, or rather reconstructing it, through the retelling that would result in a more permanent inscription in history. As already peripheral, the subjective narration from the woman storyteller is met with criticism which empowers the enunciation of a suggestive discourse, especially if questioning the Eurocentric and or Occidental model of creation of sense incorporated in every bureaucratic system in the UK and beyond. In combination with elements taken from the hegemonic representation of the reality in order to challenge the scientific and rational structuring model, my stories appear as fictions. Here is an example of that view through the technique Helen Zisu incorporates in her writing when she uses italics for another voice. And here, I simply change the voices. As I walked into my cousin's house, I found her laying on the sofa clutching the remote control of a television set too big for her room. Radio was on, as well as the video recording her flickering through the CNN, BBC satellite channels 
Serbia's national television chasing news everywhere. She embraced me in passing, welcomed into her electrical den and told me what was going on at the moment. This bastard Blair is not going to stop. I am waiting to hear when the planes leave from here to call mum and to tell her to go down to the shelter. I haven't seen her for months. When the bombing started, I heard from her every day, broadcasting the news from abroad over the phone to us. However, at television station I worked in, I was watching and making the news she received. After a couple of days of the NATO campaign, this abnormal situation in which you could diminish any second became normal. We spent more time with friends and family, mostly went partying as we wanted to celebrate life. Some people were hiding, but many knew it was hopeless because cluster bombs explode whilst in the ground, so the shelter would not protect anyone. Therefore, many of us went about our every day and even slept after the noise of the plane, bombs, defense rockets stopped in the early morning. My cousin would call even then, becoming annoying. We did not have mobile fo phones and often had to tell her that we couldn't talk because we couldn't stand by the phone all day. I let her go gently a few times, but once I was so tired of the helicopters that I'd put a bunch of blankets in the wardrobe attempting to simulate a soundproof studio so I could sleep, and I shouted at her, I can't talk because I'm in the wardrobe, and I put the phone down. Her ringing was just another noise to combat. She invited us to come to her home in the UK, but our country was in a state of emergency. Apart from me, no one from our family and her friends was able to leave Serbia. I paid for that privilege when I picked up the videotapes spread around the carpet in her living room in Norwich. She was recording the broadcast of bombing over her children's birthdays, replacing past with the present, denying her British identity. The woman who for last 20 years only saw her native city in some occasional tourist report on the UK television, now faced images of its, its, of its destruction on a daily basis. She was flipped more than I was, able to smell the pictures that we saw, that she saw. Whilst witnessing the psychological breakdown of the person incapable to live with the past and the present at the same time, I started collecting her tapes from the floor, sorting them by date, television station, program, preserving the memory that my cousin had of her children by assembling the newly established war archive from this recorded material. In this work, I'm playing with the representation of asylum seekers who look just like this, although I hit myself in the face when lifting my bike. The technique is gel lens test, and the image is a reference to the work of photographer Nan Goldin. Rather than feeling disenfranchised, I often find the exile a valuable and empowering condition that Adorno saw attached to ethics when he wrote, quote, it is part of morality not to be at home in one's home, end quote. If we can detach ourselves from belonging and place, the world becomes open, inviting, and borderless space. This approach makes exile a privilege that lasts only until one loses itself in its vastness, because an exile longs for the community even though it makes one destined for loneliness. I gather communities around my images, the process of identity creation with them and the methods in which memories are passed down across generations are essential to the formation and protection of communal identities and often are a way of coming to terms with collective past. Nietzsche reports that only the repetition of those beings whose being is becoming counts. This becoming is a performance of self a constant adjustment to the newfound surrounding that is to an exile forever negotiated as the potential space of home. 
even if it happens over and over again, the force, the enthusiasm, and the emotion with which one embarks on that performance of trying to fit in changes according to the distance to the sense of home. We pretend that we belong, and sometimes it seems so very much almost convincing ourselves that this place we are at is where we have always been in. However, the knowledge of the past grips us, not allowing that for once we really do settle somewhere as we were meant to be there. The closer, the more comfortable, the more relaxed the home feels, the more frightened it is that my identity will be lost, as I have found peace in being exiled and a great honor in it, especially in the work as an artist who is always an outsider anyway. When I forget that, my dreams, my accent, my passport remind me of it, and I embrace the exiled condition perfectly prepared to be moved aside of the regular queues at immigration checkpoints. <clears throat> In my work, <clears throat> sorry, methodology that Western societies pride themselves with ordering, indexing, and classifying is established as a tool that builds the West's own identity, supremacy, divorcement from violence, economic power, and gets reversed. As Peyton and Protevi write, active memory becomes creative when it moves beyond chronological representations and actualizes the relations of the virtual past, past in response to a present problem. Furthermore, I argue that balkanization has been instilled as a form of Orientalism, achieved through taxonomy. I try to overturn such an imposition as intangible colonial heritage by interfering in the archival process of my own work and life. I inhabit what Slovenian art collective Irving cried for, self-narrativization as an artist interested in guiding the path of understanding and creation of meaning for the audience rather than allowing them to reach for their national histories, media stories, and political positions to interpret the work in front of them. The dominant elites in charge of global flows consist of individuals who are citizens of the world as per their fluid identities. They are not like us who abandoned belonging to particular social groups. We had no choice in the matter. They had the freedom to opt for their geographical and temporal fluctuation, dipping in and out of the national, gender, and religious boundaries because it is often practical for the investment. The elites linger around the landscapes to seize the opportunities, check the pulses of the market, observing the flows of others who are pushed, rushed, and forced into movement. Us and them are not the same when roaming the world, and yet that they take themselves as nomads. We can be on the same street as long as they are inside the cafe and us on the door. We are always expecting to perform our exile so they can be differentiated precisely because we share the public space. With so many on the open sites, how would one know who really matters? I am covered in blotches of eczema. My skin exposed the mixture of Cyrillic and Latin alphabet making my Serbian and British identity visible. The letters are coming out like inverted inner tattoos. My body seems to be a medium for stories to be told without my will. I am more possessed than blessed with this burst as it isn't a reason for joy and should not be a source of jealousy. Not being able to sleep or having to accommodate non-stop imagination is a lack of peace I do not wish to anyone, especially when my soul's turmoil shows on my skin, carving a map like guiding the viewer through my world which spells out destinations of places that I have been in. My narrative is embodied, even if as a dream captured in my body. Our bodies are sites, surfaces and conduits of our experience. They are materials, platforms and screens on which our reality is projected. 
that reality radi radiates from our bodies, but we are unable to see it even though it is visible to everyone else. Its physical marks are the collections of our surroundings, displaying lines, scars, and bruises, evidencing the world around and in us. Bodies read, bodies can be read. Bodies can activate political agency and are both objects and subjects. The narratives within our bodies move across the territorial lines of demarcation. Sometimes our stories have an urge to come out even when we do not want them exposed. We aim to tell one tale and it slips into the one that is pressing us. We patiently listen to someone's and then offer feedback by providing a shocking admission in front of the other to what has happened to ourselves. We plan not to say anything, but then in the most mundane situation, we tell all. When it cannot wait, it chooses us. It does so when we do not want to, grabs the possession of our body, voice and words, and leads itself out. On the other hand, when we are willing to reveal them, the narratives might not want to be elevated from the depth of our consciousness and imagination, or even more often, they present themselves in a way that we cannot control. Seemingly able to manipulate our tales, we are frequently finding that they differ according to our circumstances within which they are told. We think about who deserves to hear which one who needs to know what or we talk to ourselves, articulating the thoughts or rehearsing them for the reception of the other. For us who permanently lost our countries, even if we are allowed or able to go back to them, this location and nostalgia are everyday subscriptions present in our surrounding as well as in the mind. However much we want to, wish or need to return, the experience of Fisher made a trail, a stamp, an imprint that would forever color that journey and so make the coming back impossible as we cannot come back to ourselves once we experience the process of becoming. Becoming another is an enduring suspension between the home and the place. We displaced will never be at home. We linger, drift, and stroll uh, along the settled lives and are vulnerable to interpretations of ourselves as the estranged, detached, and loose members of exilic communities. Exile is a psychological captivity, a perpetual condition, and paradoxically, a permanent place without fixed abode. I might be yearning for home, but accept only a condition of homelessness and the transient space, not as a place of recognition and acknowledgement, but as a space of belonging. As Apadurai claims in aspirational maps, the new trauma that the forced refugee experiences at the place of arrival is the fact that she has a story, yet there is no character, identity, or name. This lack of the counting, but the existence of the account instigates a duty to produce a record of the narrative, the story, the script. Only by collecting the diversity of the human experiences and creating their archives, we are able to understand them, which means that the truth does not emerge from the documents we made, but the process of facing, hearing, and being exposed to those evidences, as I hope you are experiencing now. And one. Okay, so I'll finish here because I ran out of time. <laughs> so you missed uh, one more. <laughs> Did we miss one? I, yeah. I don't have any more. That's okay, that's my, that's my duty then. Nella, thank you so much. Um, bear with me, I just need to re-shift re my spaces here now. Uh, um, Raph, this is now your area. I'm going to go into the moderating space. Um, Thank you very much, Nella. Um, where is Nella? Uh, Nella? Nella will come and join me uh, in, in, in the, um, uh, on the sofa, will you, Nella? Um, I am going to introduce our second uh, speaker uh, for today, uh, Dr. Paul Lowe, um, who is joining us uh, via Zoom. 
Um, so Paul is a reader in documentary photography and the course leader of the master's programme in photojournalism and documentary photography at the London College of Communication, University of the Arts, London, UK. I believe a professor as well, as I remember from the last presentation Paul gave at CE Creators Network in London. Uh, Paul is an award-winning photographer who has been published in Time, Newsweek, Live, The Sunday Times Magazine, The Observer and The Independent, amongst others. Uh, he has covered breaking news the world over, including fall of the Berlin Wall, Nelson Mandela's release, famine in Africa and the conflict in former Yugoslavia. His book, Bosnians, documenting 10 years of the war and post-war situation in Bosnia, was published in April 2005 by Saki Books. I am going to stop introducing Paul there because I am sure there will be more opportunities later for that and welcome him on Zoom. And uh, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Can we hear all right? Yeah. 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 yeah, and can you see my slides on the screen? Because I'm getting yeah. a different picture on Zoom, so I hope you can see the slide on the screen. Yes. Yeah? Yeah, we can see the slides, Fantastic. Paul. You are good Great. to go. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm going to be talking about some experiences and some uh, work we've done with artists in the former Yugoslavia who've been dealing with issues of post-conflict society um, over a number of years. And just give you some insights or some findings from some of the research we did, which involved commissioning artists to make new works and looking at how they thought about their work in relation to some of the questions around contested memories, trauma, the past, and how to work with the past and the present. Um, and this is all under the, the umbrella of a, a series of HRC, Arts Humanities Research Council, funded research projects that we've had, which are currently coming together under something which we've called the Peace and Conflict Cultural Network, which we will talk about as well towards the end. So, uh, so yeah, this was funded. This, so there was a three-year project we did, which was called Art, Reconciliation, Conflict, Culture and Community, which was a joint project between the University of the Arts London, King's College War Studies Department and the London School of Economics, where we took a critical look at what reconciliation means and whether it's a useful term or not to use in these kind of post-conflict spaces, um, particularly in a country like former Yugoslavia, where the conflict was never really resolved. There was never... Uh, an outright winner or an outright loser, and there are different narratives, different historical, different conceptual narratives about who was responsible, who was guilty, who wasn't guilty. And that still persists today, 30 years on. Um, and so the whole questions around, and then also around that, there's a whole sort of set of concerns in the way that external forces, particularly aid agencies and Western governments, have sort of forced this narrative of reconciliation onto the region. So we were really trying to, wanted to question whether that was a useful word to use in these kind of spaces at all. Um, but specifically, the part that I worked on was with the University of the Arts London and the, um, in, and the Historical Museum of Bosnia-Herzegovina, looking at the role of art and culture in, in this kind of space. So our research questions were around, you know, what is reconciliation? Is it actually even a useful term? What kind of activities are, are work within that space? And what's the role of the creative art in, in converted commas, reconciliation? Although actually a lot of what we found was that reconciliation is a term that's used a lot by funding bodies, but it's not one that, that artists and organizations on the ground like to use. They prefer other sorts of terms to deal with the same set of questions because reconciliation is often seen as this externally imposed uh, position or narrative rather than something organically coming out of a space. So um, we carried out a, a number of activities over three years. We had a number of exhibitions in which com we commissioned artists to make new works, which was very important because commissioning artworks or commissioning work within the former Yugoslavia is a relatively rare thing. It doesn't happen that often. So even though our funds were quite limited, uh, we were able to offer you know, small scale commissions to quite a wide range of artists. And I think, you know, a lot of them really appreciated that. And also the fact that the, the commissions were run through an established institution, uh, a state level institution, which is the History Museum of Bosnia Herzegovina, that they felt that was really important. And I think that's perhaps something, um, you know, one of the lessons we might learn from the Ukrainian position. I think one of the previous speakers was talking about the value of commissioning artists to make new work. And that was something that was really, really important. Um, and we did artist diaries, we did reflective diaries, we did interviews, 
we did audience responses, you know, a range of evaluation strategies to, to look at what, how does our work or how do our practitioners think about the work they're doing in this kind of context. And there were two broad sort of ways, two broad themes, as it were, that um, we, we realized that this kind of work was, was doing. One set of, of pairs were essentially looking backwards. They were about memorialization and commemoration and healing. So this was the arts as a, a way to heal traumas, to bring people together, and also the arts as remembering. So a way to commemorate, to memorialize, to remember. But they were essentially, I'm not saying they were negative, but they were backward looking. They were looking towards the past. But very interesting, what a lot of artists were talking about was actually the role of art as a space to perhaps be looking forward. So rather than being stuck in the past, as it were, it's, it's a space that where we can begin to imagine new, new possibilities, new futures. So this was a space where arts was seen as a space for dialogue, as a space for opening up parallel spaces for discussion, conversation, ideas, uh, unimagined and imagined uh, future realities, as it were. And the arts has imagined these new futures. And this is a work that we commissioned by Selma Chatovich Hughes, who's a, a Bosnian artist who, whose father was killed during the, the siege of Sarajevo and has worked on themes around trauma and conflict throughout her practice. And this is a piece that she made called Unraveled, which I think sums up in some ways these concerns very well, because it's a, it's a traditional Bosnian chilim carpet that is being simultaneously made and unmade in, at the same time. You don't quite know whether it's you know, it's, it's being taken apart or whether it's being constructed. And one of the things we did also with the exhibitions and with the commissions is we tried to integrate them into the museum's space. And the museum has a permanent exhibition around the Siege of Sarajevo, which is very object-led, very experiential. And so we installed some of the artworks into the actual museum space alongside the normal museum exhibits. And this was a very interesting kind of conversation about making intervention for, with art into this kind of historical narrative and... and providing some spaces for reflection and thought in that. So one of the key things that we discovered, and I think this is going to be very relevant in, in the Ukrainian context, is that art is a space to question and to challenge uh, what some of these narratives are, and a space where you can ask difficult questions or even complete new questions, or even not even questions at all, but you can sort of pose alternatives to these more conventional approaches and it gives this parallel space for dissent and differentiation and a space to kind of move away from the, the conventional uh, views as it were of what of what a situation has been about um some of the other things that we discovered or we we we, we realized is that art is deeply personal most of the work we were working with most of the artists we were working with had a very very invested reason for making their work that really drew on their own personal experiences um, for example, this is a piece by Adela Yusic, who is a Bosnian artist, who is one of this generation, uh, which Mladen, who you'll be talking to in a moment, is, is part of this group of artists who were children during the Yugoslav period in the 1980s and, and very early 90s. They lived through the conflict and the breakup of, of former Yugoslavia during that sort of decade of 89 to 99. Some of them were very di directly affected by the conflict, like Adela, because she was in the besieged city of Sarajevo. Others were more peripherally affected by it. They were living, you know, in, in, in Serbia, what became Serbia, and they were hearing about what was happening in the conflict, but they weren't directly involved in it. But they all had, in some way, and it had an impact, or someone like Nella, who you've just been hearing from, it had an impact into kind of destroying a previous set of, of, of realities and replacing them with another set. So Adela, uh, and, then, and then many of that generation after the conflict established themselves as sort of post-conflict artists. And that's something perhaps we can return to in the discussion because there's some really interesting and, 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 and interesting questions to think about in, in that. Um, but, and some of them have been very successful on that basis. You know, they've established very successful careers, you know, which is fantastic, obviously. But there's also a danger in that, which I think we'll return to in the discussion. Anyway, to come back to Adela, uh, her father was a Bosnian army sniper uh, defending the city of Sarajevo. And he was killed by a Serbian army sniper on the front lines when Adela was, was a young girl. And so she made this piece called Sniper, which is around her father's death. And it's it's a video installation where she's drawing... She starts off drawing on a white piece of paper, a red circle. 
and then slowly this image of her father emerges uh, onto the so and you realize what what looks like a childish sort of graffiti scribble is actually hair marking the the red dot of his eye which is how he was killed he was shot through the eye by an enemy sniper um and something else, that, as I talked about earlier on, art remembers. It, it's, it acts as a site for memorialization and memory. Um, again, another piece by Adela and Lana Chimanchayan, which is called Bedtime Stories, which was installed in the permanent exhibition of the museum uh, on the besieged Sarajevo in the historical museum. And this consists of eight sort of um, bed-shaped cubicles, uh, which you can lie down in. And each of them is a set of headphones. And playing on those headphones are stories recounted by young people who lived through the siege of Sarajevo and remember their memories from being in the shelters, uh, the basement shelters during the, the siege with no electricity, no water, no gas, no heating, trying to keep company with each other. Um, the stories are, some of them are very funny, some of them are very traumatic, some of them are very frightening, some of them are very mundane. And through listening to these stories, you get this incredibly rich sort of built up idea of how daily life was living under the siege in the shelters of the city. Um, something very important, I think, is that art can do is it can it can make us notice things that we would not otherwise notice. It can bring to our attention things that we would otherwise uh, pass by. Uh, so this is particularly uh, true of the work of Vladimir Miladinovic, who was a Serbian artist from um, just a, originally from a small town outside of Belgrade, but now but then he trained as an artist in Belgrade. And he um, makes very large scale drawings, uh, charcoal or pen and ink, in which he copies material, archival material from the Yugoslav conflict. Um, some of it's from the annals of the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia that was presented in war crimes trials, some of it's newspaper uh, cuttings from the newspapers from the time, other, other sorts of material that's sort of buried away and hidden in archives. And then by transforming these archives into large-scale artworks, he makes them visible. He takes them out of these kind of hidden spaces where they're not talked about and they're not viewed, and he brings them into the kind of white cube of the gallery. So this, for example, uh, the original photograph for this is a very small sort of, you know, a couple of centimeters across print in the archives of the ICTY, and it's the site of a mass grave in a Belgrade suburb called Batanitsa, where uh, a large number of, of Kosovan Albanians who've been murdered by Serbian paramilitary forces in 1999-98 in, in Kosovo, their bodies were then transported into Serbia and buried to hide the evidence. And then the ICTY then, then exhumed the gravesite and carried out a long investigation. And so Vladimir did research into the archives and he found these little tiny forensic pictures taken by the, the site photographers who were working on the exhumation team and then transformed them into these massive two meter by three meter size charcoal drawings. Um, I'm, I'm gonna give you a very brief history of Mladen who, who's gonna be talking afterwards. I wasn't quite sure whether I was going before him or after, but anyway, we worked with Mladen, Mladen as well. Um, on a commission in which he created a replica of a multi-barreled rocket launcher that was used during the siege of Sarajevo to bombard the city from the hills above. And using materials salvaged from uh, the Art Academy in Banja Luka, which was formerly uh, a military barracks during the, during the war. And Mladen has an, a background as well, where he was a, a conscript soldier who served his time as a conscript actually in the barracks that then became the art academy when he was an art student. And he may well talk about that during his presentation in a moment. Anyway, he, he made this replica, but instead of firing rockets, it fires water to, to feed the ground below. And we installed that on the roof of the, of the historical museum as part of our exhibition. And then something else obviously arts do is they invite empathy. They invite us to think along and with other people and to imagine other spaces. Uh, this is a, a, long, a long part of a long series of works by Dejan Kaldierovic, who's again a Serbian artist who lives in Vienna. And he's done a whole series of these works where he goes into communities. He works with young children. He records them talking about their everyday lives and then plays that back through multiple sound channels uh, with some form of sculpture that he creates, which refers to children's games. So this is an exhibition piece of his exhibition that we had in Sarajevo, which is hundreds of glass marbles, you know, the little clickers that you would play marbles with installed. And then around that, you can hear the voices of, in this case, Serbian children um, talking about 
their lives. And I think it's a very, it's a very interesting space because it takes us into the mind of a child. He doesn't ask, you know, sensitive questions. These are just children talking about their views on a range of different uh, topics. But it becomes this very intimate, very powerful, uh, p powerful kind of piece. So just to bring you up to date, that was a previous HRC funded project. Out of that has grown the Peace and Conflict Cultural Network, which is why, which I, I, I'm working on with Nella, who you just heard from. And one of the reasons why we've, we wanted to take part in, in this uh, project. Initially, this was to bring together um, artists, practitioners, museum people from former Yugoslavia and Lebanon and Colombia around these questions of, of how do we remember the past? How does the museum space or the gallery space deal with these contested memories and these problematic issues in a post-conflict society? Uh, when we began the project, it was just before the Ukrainian conflict. But obviously now we're, we're very much aware that that is looming large with that in everybody's thoughts. And we're very willing and open to begin to work more with Ukrainian artists and Ukrainian institutions. But we're also very aware, as has been very clearly demonstrated today, that we don't want to impose an external vision on that. We want to work collaboratively and together with, with Ukrainian you know, collaborators and so on. Um, and so we are just uh, about to have a conference in Sarajevo called Why Remember, which we're hoping to have Ukrainian, the issues of Ukraine as one of the themes. We're working very closely with the Imperial War Museum in London, and we're also partnering with Centrala uh, as a partner to help us ask some of these questions and think about it and do a series of workshops and, uh, and activities. And so really one of the things we want to do with this session and at the end of it is perhaps open up to discussion about how might some of the work we've done with our network be extended into the Ukrainian uh, situation and, and provide value, but also, you know, obviously learn from what's happening to the Ukrainian situations. I think in the discussion, perhaps we can come back to this, but there are a lot of interesting experiences and questions, I think, that particularly post-Yugoslav and also Lebanese artists have had from going through that process of living through a, being in one society, having that society completely uh, destroyed effectively through a conflict and then coming out the other side and then having to deal with the, the baggage of that, both artistically and, and politically and how to navigate those, those sorts of questions. So I think I'll leave it there and leave that open for some, give us some time for discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> That's brilliant, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, we will um, switch back on um, when we open the floor for questions. So, um, brilliant. I will, I will immediately move on. Um, we've got our third uh, panelist speaker on, online as well. Um, Mladen is just about to join. Um, but meanwhile, maybe, I'm, I'm not sure what I did say it at the beginning. I'm sure it's, it's written in the... Um, um, in the paperwork. So myself, Nela, Mladen and Paul are in different ways connected to former Yugoslavia. Uh, both myself, Nela and Mladen were born in former Yugoslavia, which are now, uh, but are now in three different, uh, from three different countries. And Paul is with his work and life uh, connected with Sarajevo and spends uh, much of his life between London and Sarajevo. So uh, this part of the programme is very much uh, former Yugoslavia contingent. Lovely. Mladen, are we able to hear you? Yeah. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, I'm, um, I'm ready if you are ready. So. Excellent. Mladen, if you just give me a moment, I will just introduce you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, our third panelist is Mladen Miljanovic, who was born in Zenica, then Yugoslavia, in 1981. In 2002, he enrolled at the Academy of Arts at Banja Luka Department of Painting. Besides his artistic practice and his research, he is teaching new media art at the Academy of Arts, University of Banja Luka. Mladen has participated in various group shows, including the 55th Venice Biennale, 15th Busan Video Biennale, and the recent 13th Ca uh, Cairo Biennale. He has also held solo works and projects at MUMOK in Vienna, Gallery MC in New York, ACB Gallery in Budapest, Antje Wachs Gallery in Berlin, Neue Galerie in Graz, and others. Uh, the consequences of the war and the knowledge Mladen gained in military school formed the basic reference for his art. 
uh, and as he says, art is not the goal, but rather a tool for his approach. So a very short introduction for you, Mladen, and uh, now the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, just a second. Um, let me share my screen. Um, you have my screen uh, shared? Mladen? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, the screen of mine shared? Yes, we can see the didactic wall. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Good morning. Um, here in, in New York, it's like uh, uh, past at quarter to eight. So uh, sorry if I'm a little bit uh, um, uh, uncontrolled in uh, speaking. Uh, I didn't spoke with anybody so far. So um, thank you for introduction. Uh, I, I was thinking like what to present in the context of, uh, uh, of, uh, of this call and the talk. And I was thinking that maybe something which is connected uh, with, um, let's say, uh, emergent situation, uh, it's appropriate, and also the project that acts in a solidarity, and how arts uh, and the cultural sector can act in, a, let's say, uh, emerging situations. So I will also give a like just short brief intro. Even both Paul um, and Utina uh, show it. Uh, and tell it to uh, others. I was born in uh, Zenica, Yugoslavia, and then in the 90s, we moved uh, from Zenica to a small village uh, where my father is from uh, in mid Bosnia. Then I grew up um, on a front line, like maybe 1,000 uh, meters far from the front, front line as a, as a boy, going in an elementary school. So uh, in, in that early stage of uh, childhood, basically, this um, uh, violence and uh, uh, war became really normal uh, for me uh, by the all means and everything what was going on. For example, my school was eight kilometers back from my home. So whenever I go uh, to school uh, by foot, I never knew it with the front line moves. So basically, I will run out as a refugee from the from the school. Uh, and for, uh, gladly, the front line stayed whole period of the war there, despite the huge uh, fights that were happening during the whole period of war. And then after that, uh, after the uh, peace agreement was made and the war was done, uh, there were, at that time, there was still obligatory uh, military service. And as an 18 years old boy, I needed to go to serve army. Of course, I, it was like already a trauma, and I was saying to myself, Again, uh, uh, guns and the military and so on. And I finished this military service. Uh, and afterwards, I went to, on an art academy in uh, Banja Luka University. And then uh, what happened on the third year of my studies is that art academy space in the center of the city moved in the ex-military base. So basically, I found myself again in the space of the military. And it was like, I couldn't rid of it of this kind of aspect of the militarism, uh, even I was trying like and ignoring that. And then basically I decided to confront myself with that and to use the art and means of the militarism and the knowledge from military to try to transform it into the something positive. So one of the projects that Paul showed was the transformation of the uh, let's say, the replicas of the weapon into the something positive in a sense that. So the project I'm talking to you, uh, you the didactic wall, it's a something quite recent from 2019. Uh, it was a project that was, uh, let's say, I wouldn't say inspired or uh, it was provoked by the uh, situation uh, which was called, I don't like this term, migrant crisis uh, in Bosnia where the most of the people uh, from Syria and different parts uh, of the Middle East were uh, going uh, to the Europe. And the Bosnia uh, became a place uh, in between for them, uh, in between of running from and in between, between and the goal they are achieving to come. So um, in one moment in 2019, uh, the uh, because the Bosnia is the final state before they enter the European Union, which is the Croatia, uh, the huge amount and huge number of the uh, immigrants was uh, based there, and especially in this northwest uh, town, uh, Bihać, 
uh, where the most of them were stuck just before the Croatian border. And you know, in in this very hectic uh, uh, um, uh, moment, uh, I was like thinking and looking how the cultural uh, world and how artists could respond on this. And unfortunately, it was very, I would say, passive way. You know, people were also confused. You know, what what can you do in the, such an emerging situation as an artist? And <clears throat> in the sense of that, then I was started thinking. Uh, what, what what are the ways how, the, let's say, this kind of experience of the war and the military knowledge can be uh, out of the practical use? And uh, I uh, went to Bihać. I have a friend there, Irfan Hoshic, who is running an amazing uh, art space, Krak Center. Uh, at that time, um, he was collaborating with the City Gallery, Bihać. And I said, I have idea uh, to work on a project. I don't know how it will outcome. Uh, to uh, make a set of illustrations uh, from my military books uh, that uh, I was using um, uh, in, a, in the army as a books. But uh, my idea was uh, to create a small uh, handbook, uh, pocket book, which will uh, transform these military illustrations into the illustrations that could be out of the help in various uh, segments like uh, there is a segment uh, of orientation, there is a segment of uh, first aid, uh, there is a segment of um, masking, there is a segment of surveillance and things like that. So um, you know, uh, the, at the beginning, you know, it's it it was like a very simple idea, but uh, uh, at the same time, it was uh, let's say in some sort of gray zone uh, of uh, legality. Uh, at that period, people uh, who were just pointing with a finger where the migrants could cross the border were arrested and being accused to threatening the state uh, uh, security. And uh, at the very same moment, uh, Irfan uh, and I decided uh, to do a work which will help those people to overcome these borders and the uh, uh, obstacles they found on it. So. Uh, uh, what what basically the procedure of the project was that I uh, scanned all these military uh, illustrations. I transformed uh, the all the soldiers, uh, which was the act uh, of demilitarization of the knowledge. And I think this became uh, very important in this work because this aspect of uh, anti-militarism and demilitarization, not only of people, but the militarization of knowledge was something that was here very important. And um, then um, those uh, those all illustrations uh, were rewritten and compressed into this book that we are seeing uh, in a slide. Uh, after that, uh, there was a there was a piece. Uh, it was done uh, as a form of installation uh, to be inside the city gallery. What was very convenient in, in for this project that we were doing. It was that uh, city gallery of Bihać is located directly in the center of the city where the most of the migrant was. And um, this sort of, let's say, action was also questioning how far art can go in intervening into reality and moderating reality. Can, can art change something? Can art help in this emerging situation to, to, uh, uh, to this very sensitive group of people can art act uh, solidar, uh, not only in a sense of uh, saying about being solidar with someone, but also to act in solidarism. And uh, I need to admit that uh, the uh, for for a risky project, uh, for uh, artists who do risky projects, you always need, uh, and the brave projects, you need to have a, uh, brave curators. You need to brave uh, have brave galleries who are willing to risk. And at this uh, uh, for this project, all people included, both the gallery uh, Irfan as a curator and me, were at the same page. And um, then uh, at the opening uh, to the Red Cross, uh, we had a like a full gallery uh, of um, uh, of uh, migrants who uh, picked this. Uh, books who were there was one piece uh, inside the gallery that was basically um, let's say the token 
in a sense that all these illustrations that were compressed in the uh, didactic wall handbook uh, were engraved uh, on this huge, uh, gigantic eight section uh, marble wall. So the people could watch it both on this uh, object and what was very important in a sense of the handbook itself that I'll say a little bit more to, to, to talk about the project. It was like that um, handbook itself inside was translated on uh, Urdu, Farsi, uh, Spanish and English. And it was also acting that somehow, um, even when we respond in the solidarity, sometimes we uh, think that, for example, in this case, migrants, everybody understand English, which is not true. So the idea was, let's bring uh, the text, uh, which was very simple because there were illustrations that act as visual text uh, to them. Let's translate it on the languages that they understand, which of course, uh, in the sense of uh, realization of the project is complicated, but we succeeded through the helps of some people who were translating it. And uh, at the end, uh, we didn't knew it. I need to admit, would it work? Um, would it help? Uh, in a sense, but I knew it only one, that later on uh, development will show would it, did, it, did it help. And what happened later on, it was like that just maybe uh, seven days or two weeks after um, I was contacted by the one uh, uh, researcher and the professor from a reading university, uh, Federico Falopa. Uh, he uh, he was uh, researching and uh, doing interviews with the migrants in a migrant center, and he texted me. I didn't knew at him. Uh, I didn't even have him on my uh, phone list or social media. And he texted me a message. Uh, I don't know you, but I was in a, a, a migrant camp, and I met the people reading some small books. I asked him what is that. They told me it's a project. Uh, somebody did, they didn't even know it why, but, but that was not important. And they said that the book has many uh, valuable illustrations that could help to them. So I, at that moment, I knew it, it works. And also, unfortunately, uh, in the wrong context, uh, confirmation of the project that it uh, succeeded to penetrate, let's say, the reality and the political sphere was when uh, one uh, mainstream creation TV uh, in the main news uh, had this manual uh, talking like um, there is uh, uh, there is no any kind of uh, human conditions for a migrant in Bosnia, but there is uh, this. And they showed this manual and saying like, this is uh, how Bosnian people are uh, uh, educating migrants how to come to European Union and so on and so on. So it was in a, it was in a very let's say anti-migrant manner uh, uh, made, but for both Irfan uh, and uh, and me and the gallery city gallery in Bihać, it was a let's say it's sort of confirmation that our art still can find a way uh, how to intervene into burning social issues. Uh, of course, in this kind of interventions, uh, both artists and institutions must act uh, sensitively. Uh, in a sense, and uh, for me, in this case, I succeeded somehow to merge uh, both idea of demilitarization, uh, the personal experience, and also to act uh, in a manner of help at a, uh, at a certain uh, certain moment. This is how all this uh, uh, setup look at like uh, later on. And uh, there were also exhibited these uh, ready-made books. And these are the Yugoslav uh, National Army uh, books uh, that I basically uh, pick uh, the, uh, the, all these illustrations that we redraw uh, into, the, uh, into the, beside, beside, uh, beside this installation and the handbooks inside the gallery, um, uh, there is this kind of road which goes from Bihać to border with the Croatia where the most migrants is going through as a route. And uh, every time when I'm exhibiting this uh, work uh, somewhere outside, the, um, the only uh, a term that I uh, set uh, when I'm exhibiting it is that basically the gallery who is exhibiting the work must uh, place the billboard with this illustration on the route where the migrants is going and also at the same time to print another edition of the handbooks that we are sent off back to Bosnia uh, to this region of um, uh, to this region of uh, uh, of Bihać so um, uh, yeah 
this I was thinking that it's a project that uh, it's uh, in alignment uh, with the uh, idea how art artists uh, could uh, could act, let's say, in this side kind of uh, different, difficult, uh, burning issues that none of the artists and the cultural institution uh, is prepared for. I'm not interrupting your your uh, presentation, um, but I think yeah, very applicable, very relevant. Lots of um, potential provocations there for conversation to be continued. Thank you very much. I will immediately um, sort of open the floor for um, a conversation. Um, Maybe with one additional provocation um, and then invite our panelists for reflection on that and then maybe also um, everyone present, especially in the context of solidarity with Ukraine, but also an enormous amount of knowledge that we have Dado. here. An enormous amount of knowledge that we have here based on previous experiences from about 30 years ago or less. Um, so I will offer a provocation by suggesting that British creative sector tends to be specifically guilty of so-called performing diversity. I don't know if you will be able to, um, or if you agree with me or if you've encountered the performing diversity, um, but uh, I have a feeling uh, as a practicing artist, cultural leader and a producer that that is very often the root of the so-called short-term responses which Tatiana addressed in her opening keynote. Um, so my question to panelists and speakers and um, participants here and online would really be around discussing how can we ensure longevity and how can we embed the response of solidarity, but not only solidarity, but also deep understanding within structures and institutions, and that is something that Vlada has brought up in their presentation. And a lot of problems are institutional. So what we, what we do acknowledge is the nimbleness of small or independent or underground initiatives, but what we also do have to acknowledge is the reality of institutions and systems with, with, which are in existence and in which, with which we have to be in constant dialogue. Um, so perhaps um, opening the floor for maybe examples of really good practice or really bad practice from which we might need to remove ourselves. And as I say, particularly uh, Mladen, Paul, Nella, uh, experience that you have, lived experience that you have as artists um, who have uh, experienced exile as artists who have migrated into the area of former Yugoslavia and as artists who lived in the area of former Yugoslavia but have international practice. Um, shall we start with Nella maybe or someone on Nella? I have no idea what you just asked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Um, I'm just going to go back to my question. So I want to talk about longevity and response of solidarity within structures and institutions. What are your examples, let's say, of good practice if we're talking about how to embed that longevity rather than just perform diversity? Mm -hmm. Well, it's always work uh, with uh, people from other spaces that are not having the labels that are attached to your own community but that requires some kind of um, uh, personal development going beyond uh, national and personal structures. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really challenging if you are working with people who are coming from conflict zones within which you are implicated by the nationality that you belong to or the culture or the gender or whatever. So kind of surpassing yourself is the work that we all have to do on ourselves. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, for me, this was uh, um, uh, quite uh, an opening, and I am very grateful that it happened in my life when I was kind of quite young and therefore willing mm -hmm. to do so. So, um, Nimble, flexible. Still. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was. Um, uh, it was an experience, and uh, you know, in relation to the art world, 
uh, I think what was the mutual experience for all of us who are coming from ex-Yugoslav republics um, um, into the UK with this kind of um, uh, troubled past that forbade us from talking to each other, let alone share the spaces, mm -hmm. was the mutual experience uh, of um, uh, refugeedom uh, and the British government. And this is what started uniting us, this kind of acknowledgement of the tropes of Orientalism that we were not necessarily experiencing in our own countries in relation to each other. But, and also the kind of, um, uh, the interpretations of the national histories that we knew were not in, align, in alliance with what it is that we knew of each other. So we started moving from hostilities into seeing what it is that we actually have in common. And this was um, a journey uh, and, it, and it wasn't easy um, uh, because there were spaces where we couldn't see each other face to face. There were spaces where we openly argued. There were spaces when we were, um, I think, aggressive at some points as well. There were moments where we um, supported each other. And I mean, for me, the first time that it has happened when I kind of saw myself getting out of myself and kind of one person stayed on the sofa and the other walked away was, uh, was when um, an, an artist from Kosovo, an, an Albanian poet, was reading an account uh, of uh, her memory of the Serbs coming into the village and loading uh, her uh, classmates, male classmates, on a truck and taking them away into the unknown. And she was reading this story um, to a bunch of people from all over the world, but only I, the Serb, knew what it actually meant, the gravity of this moment when she's articulating this. And she has been articulating up to the point when she started crying and she couldn't talk. But this story wanted to come out and it was really, really important that somebody does it for her, but nobody stood up because the moment she, she started crying, everybody looked at her like, oh, poor her. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, no, she's not going to have this kind of victims, you know, a label. And I stood up and I sat down and I read about the atrocities of my own people to everybody in the audience. And this kind of sense of shame became something else. Mm -hmm. And two of us started talking. And this was the moment where I ended up being a, 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 fr a friendship that I kind of participated in the birth of her daughter. It was to this day, something that really marked me. And it wasn't the only experience because from then on, I was able to kind of be in the room with Bosnian artists and kind of acknowledge the fact, mm, the work of her, uh, the visual artist is 10 times better than my own. And it's just, it's nothing to do with identity, nothing to do with nationalism, she's just much better than <laughs> <laughs> So it was just, you know, and you know, you, you, start, you start growing. You start growing in, as you would if, even if you stayed in your own country. That makes no difference, you know. These are the people with their own experiences. And, you know, these experiences of art opened up or, or arts practice that we shared opened up difficult conversations. No, and thank you. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I'm so sorry. sorry, I didn't mean... No, I just wanted to say thank you because I really appreciate you bringing up this, again, referring back to Paul, the deeply personal moment as well, which always stays deeply personal. Um, but personal is political. Of course. That's, that's, that's my view. Personal, however individual, is deeply political as well and, um, and vast. Um, I'm just wondering, because I'm seeing a question from the audience immediately, Actually, two questions from the audience, but I'm just aware that we haven't heard. So just before we take questions from the audience, could I ask our panel that is on Zoom, perhaps Mladen, just a really quick reflection. Are there any examples of good practice you might have witnessed as, a, as an artist um, that might suggest longevity of expressions of solidarity um, that we could build on or potentially apply in this situation and particularly in British creative sector. 
uh, translate them from your experience? Oh, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I think it's more uh, related institutional question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I need to admit that both we as, as artists uh, have this question in mind as well, because this is, the, this is always a, uh, uh, it's a, it's always issue like which you have like when when you when you do something when you intervene somewhere you think what is longevity of that you know like you, you think what will remain how it could be sustained and how it can act later on because this is that problem what artists have like uh, I mean it's not a problem it's a, 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 it's it's an, a, a question that we deal with all the time. You know where where the life of the work starts. Uh, uh, does it only in a process, which is very important, and how it continues after it's displayed and out of the control of the artist? Uh, I think that in that moment, the the uh, uh, the responsibility of continuum of the work to act uh, 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 in the long term uh, is shared between institution and artist. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, this is a moment when 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 this kind of I would say. Uh, the partnership, uh, uh, it's become very important. So I think that's why I think that the responsibility of the institutions to sustain the, the good practices uh, 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 and to make them present in the public realm are the, the responsibility itself. And also to recognize those, uh, let's say, the practices, uh, practitioners and artists whose work can act widely uh, in the in the sense, like Paul was mentioning, to warn, in the sense to act in reality, but uh, uh, also I think that uh, both Nella, Paul, and me we we, we talked about it um, mostly of practices, uh, like Paul was mentioning and showing examples of recon reconciliation uh, and um, uh, those who are directed to heal society, but. It's also important to say these practices are also to heal ourselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, I think I cannot agree more. I mean, just having the three of us sitting here, having had in our own very different ways, and I presume we are generationally quite similar, um, our own memory. It's just something that I was reminded the other day. I have a 13-year-old, and he just threw, threw a question at me. Oh, you don't remember what you were doing at 13? And I thought, yeah, I don't. Actually, I do. It was the first air raids we have experienced, so that was my sort of 13th year. Anyway, sorry, Paul, I didn't mean, um, uh, um, Mladen, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, um, if, if I just throw um, a moment to Paul to reflect on the same question before we then start taking questions and discussions from the floor. Um, yeah, speaking as a white, middle-aged man with a beard, I always find it, it's always difficult with these diversity issues. Um, but I think what, what I, I think the important thing is that you need to be aware of your positionality in that and your, you know, the, the power relationships that are implicit in these things. And what I've always tried to do is use what small amount of influence or ability I might have to fundraise, to create, to, to, to try and to create spaces to make things happen that would not perhaps have happened otherwise. I'm not, I'm not so arrogant to think that I can change the world. But I think what we can do, if we do have some small amount of, of influence or power, is try to create environments or spaces where other people can express their, their voices, can get their work made. I mean, as I said, I think, you know, I, I was very proud of what we did with the Historical Museum and the HRC funding. It was one of the first times the HRC had given funding directly to commission artists mm -hmm. to produce work that we would then, you know, analyze and work on. And um, part of the result of that was we had a group show of the artists we commissioned in London. Um, with Mladen and uh, Vladimir and, and I think Adela Yusich and so on. And they all came over. And I remember, it's more of an anecdote really, but I think it's a very important point to bear in mind, particularly in the context of some of the early discussions around the relation between Ukrainian and Russian institutions. So we were sitting in, in the pub after the opening and I was listening to this, you know, this group of people who'd become kind of friends, but they were also talking about the, the shows they were in, the curators they were working with, the, 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 the ways in which their work was being circulated, the commissions they were getting, and so on and so forth. And, you know, there, there were four or five artists who were all, who were all one, once from the same country, 
with a set of shared horizontal, as it were, values, not just language, but cultural values, cultural reference points, artistic reference points, who were now living in four different countries, which were separated by extremely powerful vertical barriers of ethnonationalism mm. and, and corruption and political political dialogues. But they had a very common shared language. And I think to try to try to work on those horizontal connections that are very powerful and, and, and very often transcend the kind of vertical um, vertical separations that are sometimes, I mean, they're often historically rooted, but they're also sometimes very much pursued by political elites as their agenda today, and they're being amplified because of that. I think we're seeing that in the UK as much as we are in, in the Ukrainian conflict. But I think it's, it's very valuable not to lose sight of those horizontal connections, and I think that's where I think it's going to be very diff difficult to navigate, but very important that there are still points of contact made between diaspora Russians, diaspora Ukrainians, uh, Russian institutions that are against the current regime, um, whether that's in, in, in Russia, although it's very difficult there, but, but if they're outside of Russia. And I think it's it's a very simplistic, in a way, I don't want it to be too critical of one of the previous speakers, but I think to just say, oh, we're not going to collaborate with any Russian uh, of any kind, in any shape, any way or form, you know, it's, it's difficult. I mean, today, you know, we're doing quite a lot of work in Belgrade, bringing Bosnian artists to Belgrade, Serbian artist Sarajevo, there's still a huge set of issues around the way that the conflict in Belgrade is being represented and so on. But I think that's still very important work to be doing, to be working across these across these divides and finding these horizontal connections that, that can bring people together rather than focusing on the vertical ones that divide. Absolutely, Paul. I, I mean, I, I have to say it is just drawing on again on on experiences and on past knowledges because the question sometimes really has to be how are we moving on? And it, it is not saying we don't acknowledge and particularly difficult situations we are in at the moment, but how do we, what is the next step we take? Um, okay, I'm, I, I think it's, it, we've got a little bit of time um, uh, before we, we um, continue into our lunch, which I'm sure will be a really fruitful uh, moment for exchanging dialogues um, uh, going onwards from this session. I'm just going to go um, in the order of hands that I've seen raised. Um, so thank you very much. I'm so sorry for such a long wait. And thank you so much for your answers, uh, Paul and Mladen and Nella. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the panelists for the um, work that they've shared with us is so inspirational and thank you for sharing your individual stories as well. I want you to go back to your question about solidarity and positive experiences and um, I want you to say um, how can we multiply the experience that Nela shared earlier, the experience of you know stepping up and human to human um, kind of multiplying those experiences that can bring change and how can through the art um, using the, the, the powerfulness of art being boundaryless, you know, talking to the soul directly, forgetting politics. How can art projects kind of be created for all generations so they can, so for example, uh, stuck in my head one of the slides from Paul's presentation, art remembers mm -hmm. and remembering hurts. So then we need to heal. Yeah. So how can, um, some of the work that you currently doing or plan to do can kind of aim to um, uh, bring generations together, uh, generations that experience those to heal, new generations that hear it as stories, to use it in a way that they don't hate, so then we have a cycle that never ends, um, but then, you know, use that, as, as, as also a way of learning and healing and not hating, but you know, moving forward in a, mm. in a peaceful way. Mm. So I, I, I mean, I presume that is a more general question for creatives and cultural leaders across how can we, my, one of my first ideas is, I've got it also as one of the provocations, but how do we create spaces of empathy? How do we, walk in someone else's shoes and what are in creative way the best modes of initiating that walk in someone else's shoes through art through art absolutely yeah. i mean i presume i i i, I, you, I, I is this kind of just an open question or shall we just leave it as an open question or would you would you 
I mean, I also think anybody here in the room, if, if there is an immediate idea of how do we, how do we create spaces of empathy, um, because I think it is important creating spaces of empathy rather than spaces that are didactic and spaces of being told off or spaces of being um, spoken to, rather spaces of dialogue and exchange. And obviously, I am acknowledging that in Britain, when, when I sometimes sit in spaces, I'm sitting in spaces of people who have not experienced conflict within their lifetime. And I think it is a very fortunate position, but also it is a position which I cannot resent. Nobody here should resent. It's just a life circumstance. I'm so sorry. Before we do move on, I am just aware that there was, there was a question coming from there. Was it um, uh, Vlada? You had, I'm so sorry. I'm keeping you in mind. Um, yeah, um, I just wanted to um, first thank you all for your wonderful presentations. Um, and they were very, like, it was beautiful because it was in a form that's quite hard for us to do. Um, intellectualizing and removing yourself from experiences of wartime in such a way is something that we aspire to do as well within academic and institutional spaces. But I do want to problematize a few things because we are having this discussion and this conference I think is built on um, solidarity one year on from um, Russia's invasion um, of Ukraine and I would please ask everyone to use the proper language because language is extremely important. Um, and there's a few things that I just wanted to throw into the mix that maybe people here should also be thinking about more so um, because it was extremely difficult to listen at times. First of all, going beyond nationhood is a very Western concept and it's very interesting and it erases completely certain anti-colonial uh, struggles. Um, and we hear these narratives a lot. We hear these narratives a lot and they go into the pacifist narratives that unfortunately were a little present right now. Um, talking about peace is great. Talking about the fact that we should be collaborating with diasporic Russians or uh, institutions that are against the Russian regime is all great, um, but I want to ask, what's your positionality in this? Um, why are we getting taught how to deal with first-hand experiences of wartime? Um, I think, Paul, you mentioned something in your presentation uh, that, you know, like people in ex-Yugoslavia, they looked at people in the West as someone who's like coming in to do the peace talking, but unfortunately I felt the same exact way right now. Um, and again, it's great to hear all of your experiences. Um, it's great and I hope maybe we can learn from them. Vlada, thank you so much. I think I have a, a response from Nella. Nella, did you want to offer a response to? Are you, is, 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 is that all right? Would you? Uh, no, I mean, I wanted to finish if that's oh, okay. Very oh, so quickly. sorry, I thought um, you have. It's okay. And I am, there can be no horizontal connections built right now, and I hope that you're hearing us when we say this, because we're going through an active phase of erasure while you're giving us experience of something that happened 30 years before. And last thing, um, on the conference of Why Remember, that sounds absolutely beautiful, and I have a lot of colleagues who are going there, but please don't talk about Ukraine without Ukrainians being present there, because it's a very colonial thing to do. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your response, Vlada. Um, uh, are we happy going to Nella first? And, and yeah, yeah, then okay. I can we'll go. Yeah, you can do it. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. you're fine. Um, so, um, a few points. Um, um, the conflict that we are uh, talking about uh, lives with us. So, that's the, the first thing. So, it's not 30 years ago the countries that we have abandoned uh, are still experiencing the consequences uh, of that conflict that might arise uh, any point, at any point at this particular stage. Um, uh, there is a young boy that walked into high school and killed uh, masses of people in Serbia, simply because arms are still an everyday presence uh, in that environment. 
Uh, third thing, we do not have our country, so we have to go beyond nationhood because it doesn't exist. We have no nations as such. We know by, by the experience that uh, we share as Yugoslavs that doesn't exist anymore, that uh, we are forced into the nationalism in order to even have the legal right to travel because you need to belong to a nation rather than to the community nowadays. The fourth thing, um, Nobody is here lecturing you. We are sharing experiences. This is ours. If you can learn from it, great. If you don't want to learn from it, great. If you want to take it somewhere, great. If you want to put it in artwork, great. Whatever, what, you know, this was an offering. It wasn't a lecture. That's fourth, the fifth thing. Um, the conflict is a unique experience and how one goes about it is, is their, their own journey. Um, nobody um, is able to say anything to Ukrainians at the moment. The war is still going on. This, this is, you, you're not going to even begin the journey that, that we are on with ever, without ever finishing it because the conflict is not over and you, you, don't, you don't have that point from which you could even be exchanging things that, that we have at the moment. And there is an, uh, an acknowledgement of that. We, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know why would one feel that our experience is somehow um, over um, eradicating or, or kind of um, overdrawing what it is that people are feeling now. Um, the conference that we are uh, organizing in Sarajevo will have Ukrainian presence if we are going to be talking about Ukraine. But Ukraine at the moment is one of the conflicts that is happening in the world. And we are in the, in the uh, research um, uh, network that uh, we have formed dealing with four different conflicts. There, there are many aspects that we are conveying here, and I am understanding completely um, the uh, emotional uh, draw that uh, comes from um, Ukrainians at this particular point, because it's absolutely natural. We are trying to help by telling our stories. If it doesn't help, I'm sorry, we'll try something else. But this is how we hoped we can help. This is what we can do right now um, as artists, because when the war for us was over, we were together in the same pot, Central and East European artists. And we had to carve our lives from that label within the country that nobody knew how to navigate. And we had to come together to see how is that even possible. For many, this is still not possible. For some, it's moving in some direction. Some of us who ended up having families here changed the stake with which that art now uh, operates. That art is a different investment depending on which uh, um, uh, phase of life uh, we are in. These, these things require an experience and a journey, and time, and time that, that reflects both of those. Maybe this is not the time for you, but when there is a time, find me. Nella, thank you very much. I am just going to, I'm just also going to acknowledge that um, Subjects that we are all opening, and Vlada, you were saying, what is people's positionality? The short answer is people's positionality is having been through war. That is it. Sorry, Bosnian voice is Mladen. It's all right. It just, I'm just. I'm so sorry, yeah. Vlada, I, because we can we can develop uh, yeah. dialogue. And please, 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 notate your thoughts because I think they are really, really important to explore. What I just wanted to also suggest is just to acknowledge that there is a lot of trauma in this room and on the screen. And 
I think that just needs to be really, really carefully held mm -hmm. um, because uh, spaces are open for people that, just like Nella now said, once they have been opened there, and not just Nella, I mean, we've got Armenian colleagues here who have got their own stories. Um, we have got so many potential uh, uh, spaces in the room, I presume Albanian, Kosovian, um, I think we really need to navigate those spaces very, very carefully because they are each individual story that carries its own consequences and processes. Um, I'm aware there is an unanswered question from over there. Are people still okay? Because we are going now heavily into our lunch break. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to leave pretty soon, I'm afraid. Paul, thank you. Over. Thank you so much. Um, we're just going to take um, a question and then we might kind of reflect back. Paul, I'm just wondering if you had time, I was just wondering if you could offer a response to Vlada for a direct question that was forwarded to you, but I'm just hoping to take a question from the floor now and then potentially even if you had it in a written form or thoughts that... Um, um, I mean, I could just respond. I mean, I don't, you know, obviously we don't want to get into kind of fights over who's got the right to be be represented. Um, I think the point of our presentation is really to offer some insights from a society that's gone through a very traumatic war in which hundreds of thousands of people were also killed and displaced. Um, but look at how, what happens after that mm. and ways that, as, a, as an artistic community, we can find ways to connect and to... And I just used the example of Vladimir, you know, um, who I showed earlier on. He's a Serbian artist making work which is critiquing the current Serbian government's contemporary vision of what happened in the past, but also actually what the war crimes that were committed in that time and, and, and making something visible that would otherwise remain invisible. I mean, Batanat is a suburb of Belgrade that is on the way from the airport. When you drive from the airport, you drive right past it. But the vast majority of Belgrade people probably don't even know that there was a, a war crime site there. And I think he's making that visible. So I think, you know, we're not we're not trying to. There are no, we're not. There are no competing narratives in this. There are complementary narratives. I think that's the important point. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. That is um, helpful. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, at this moment, I just thought about. Um, Omid Jalili, the actor and the comedian, and his joke when he was talking about his Iranian um, um, sort of roots and reaction to tense situations. And in one of his jokes, he said that um, usually in tense situations, Iranians start singing or dancing. <laughs> 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 and I have to admit there was a tense moment that I sort of observed here, but also a very moving and beautiful moment um, in a sense of sort of everything that was said and asked and commented, like how do we move on? How do we um, progress without, how do we move on without hatred? How do we, is it vertical? Is it horizontal movement? You know, how do we deal with these traumas and and memories and feelings that we have um, as artists, as refugees, as migrants, as observants, as participants, etc. Um, so yeah, I feel like breaking into some old Yugoslavian folk song. <laughs> Do you know it? I know quite a few, yeah. Being Bosnian, living in Croatia, having affiliation with... <laughs> Give us something. <laughs> <laughs> Not right now. I think, I think quickly our sound engineer uh, goes through his playlist yeah. and, and, and offers an, a nice song to break into. <laughs> Samuel oh, has really looked at idea, it. Yeah. I'll uh, uh, pass it on to him. But um, yes, just, I, I just wanted, do I have a minute, an extra minute? Are we, are we all, I think this needs to be a communal decision. Yes, I think, I think Maria also has a question, but maybe we can, um, I mean, we, we are a fairly sort of compact um, community we... here, so maybe we can take it over lunch if you don't. Yeah, I was going to suggest we just like break for lunch and have the conversation while we're on lunch. Cause... Decamp, decamp at lunch. Um, I would just like to invite everyone, obviously, just repeating, it is a space that is a very sensitive space, but I think, as you've suggested, I think we potentially need some good 
celebratory soul music uh, that is just moving us out of these spaces into which we can spiral. So just acknowledge that within yourself. And then let's just move on with kindness. I think that's probably just quite important for both lunch and the afternoon. I, I want to thank um, both of my presenters here on screen. Thank you so much for your contribution. If you can stay with us, brilliant. Um, if you can't, absolutely fine. You, you, you go on about your days. Um, thank you for joining. And Nella, thank, thank you so you. much for your input. Thank you. thank you for all of your personal and professional experiences uh, shared. Uh, we are going to now break for lunch. I believe lunch is going to be served. Is it downstairs? Um, and uh, you, I'm sure you will be called in good time to uh, be back at this space ready for the afternoon. And yeah, hopefully uh, we will have Thank many you. good thought-provoking conversations over lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, now I think we're ready. Uh, so uh, the third panel uh, will uh, look into how can we learn from examples of collaborations within the creative Armenian communities. How can we learn from artists living in Armenia and in the UK in active conflict? Uh, we're going to start with uh, Karen Babayan. Karen is a multidisciplinary artist and writer. Born in Iran to British Armenian parents, her family moved to the UK in 78 due to the impending Islamic revolution. Uh, <clears throat> Karen is an established artist with over 15 solo exhibitions in the UK, Armenia and Canada. Her work is in many public and private collections, including Tate Britain, uh, London Museum of Modern Art, New York, etc. Uh, she says, image making, performance and fiction, writing enable me to explore and tell the stories of my past and present self. Diaspora Armenian identity is investigated through handed down family stories and personal experience. Karen also activates photographs, uh, both from her own and other public and private archives, incorporating them into new work through projection, a variety of print media, painting, and now fiction, fiction writing. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Centrala, for inviting me to this conference. It's a real privilege to be here. Um, I'm an artist that has been living in the UK now 43 years, and I came when I was 16 as a result of the Islamic Revolution. It was about to kick off, and we were two months in the UK when uh, the Shah left, the Ayatollah came, and my life completely changed. So whilst I look like a white English woman, I have quite a lot of um, history behind me. Um, many generations of displacement, in fact, because my Armenian heritage in Iran was 400 years prior to that they were displaced by Shah Abbas. And um, this is a photograph of my grandmother as a child in Calcutta. And what she was doing there is very interesting. This is one of her, her school teachers. And she was the teacher's pet. And she told me many stories. My, probably it was my grandmother who got me radicalized, I would say, probably and fervently feeling myself Armenian, very proud to be Armenian, part of that Armenian culture. Um, so photographs, family stories, talking over a cup of coffee, Armenian coffee, a cup of uh, Armenian sorge, and there'll be a, a lot more of that. That is all fed into my work. Um, uh, my grandmother, this is a photograph taken in a studio three months after her wedding, and here she is already three months pregnant with my mother, and she is only 15 years old. And this is, this is the kind of family stories that are fascinating and that has fed into my work, which is now incorporating, as well as the painting, the printmaking, the photography, um, uh, filmmaking, fiction writing, performance, and now theater. Um, not only performative art or performance art, but theater. Um, art within f uh, found objects, uh, shoes have a very potent image uh, for lots of cultures, obviously, with the, um, the Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, the images of abandoned shoes, but um, my grandmother's wedding shoes in this photograph, and then their images, and then it becomes a book. And this was part of my PhD um, work that I did, um, in, it was published in 2012, Blood Oranges Dipped in Salt, and at that time I didn't realise that I was creating a, a piece of autoethnography. And um, uh, it was a collection of stories spanning 400 years, some of which I completely imagined, but based in, on accounts in history books, but others from my own experience, and I spent quite a lot of time interviewing family members who had been dispersed to Canada, to the United States, to Cyprus, and who were also still living in Iran. Um, series of prints uh, using maps, they became uh, folders of prints using text, um, text based on Edward Said's pivotal work, Orientalism. T initially, when I started writing, it was just using words that could be interpreted, misinterpreted, the words controversy, images. So the photograph here is of um, my mother dressed up as a gypsy going to a costume party, which was subsequently subverted and used as a, 
a pin-up for an Iranian calendar for the new Iranian woman and, and, and uh, plastered all over the city of Tehran, much to the horror of my grandfather at the time, and his daughter was only 14, and then an image of my grandmother with her identity papers in the Islamic Republic of Iran. This became pieces of silk, um, huge scale. Here it's in, at, at York Minster. And the, the use of silk, printing on silk, is also part of the legacy of the Armenians of Iran. They were silk traders, and that was the reason why they were forcibly removed from the region of Nakhichevan to Iran for the purposes of being taxed for the Shah, um, who then used that money to enforce his borders and pay for his military. And this is the scale that this piece functions at, but it also is part of Blood Oranges Dips in Salt as a fold-out map for that book. So um, working, um, kind of finding my way as an artist and as a creative making work, in the community in Leeds, and then subsequently I moved to Cumbria. And there's another level of kind of isolation, really. But moving to Cumbria was the first conscious decision I had made as an adult of where I wanted to go to. It was in my hands. It was totally my own fate. But I also found myself very much in isolation in the north of England, the only Armenian I knew of. So the Armenian Institute in London became a lifesaver, and it was through partly my PhD work and meeting um, an academic, Dr. Susan Patti, who was um, the director of the Armenian Institute, and subsequently Tatevik Avazian took over as that role. And the role that the Armenian Institute played in keeping me within the cultural, cultural embrace, really, of the Armenians uh, in the UK was absolutely vital, and especially during lockdown, very, very uh, crucial for me. But Spoken Postcards performance was one of the um, events that I participated in as an artist, and it was part of a, another larger exhibition, Treasured Objects, uh, which was at SOAS um, in London at the Brunei Gallery. And uh, it was an exhibition of literally what it was, treasured objects in people's own collections within the gallery that included a silk cloth that, in fact, was part of um, Susan Patty, um, my mentor. Her family had, uh, the, her great-grandmother had survived the genocide and brought this silk cloth, which she herself had raised the silkworms, uh, taken the silk, woven the silk, created this cloth. The cloth had gone with them on this horrific monumental journey, and my piece on the silk, the printed silk, was also juxtaposed by it. But the, the postcards were the way I connected, and there was another exhibition of collected, a collection of postcards which um, was curated by Osman Kokar, um, and uh, it was scenes of everyday life in the uh, previous Ottoman Empire of Turkey, in Turkey, the Armenians living in Turkey, and, um, and uh, so, I, my role was then to write a series of postcards to Susan. There were about 30, over, about 30 postcards over a period of two months. And where I live in Cumbria now is the, where the Appleby Horse Fair happens every year, where Gypsy and Romani uh, communities come and gather, and it's, um, it's a mecca for that community. So it's all about that kind of traveller experience, displacement. And um, so a performance was created whereby words from the a collection of postcards were spoken aloud, as well as the, the text that I'd sent. Um, and it was a performance piece that was curated by another Anglo-Armenian called Seta White. Um, going on to the kind of more performative works, um, as I said, very always frustrated by l l seeming to be a white English woman where I have this history of um, uh, in, within Iran and the Armenians of Iran and this painting by Robert Shirley, you can see behind me, so I've, I've dressed in costume, but Robert Shirley was painted by the eminent painter Van Dyck and here he is dressed as the ambassador for the Shah of Persia. The this, this same Shah who uh, forced uh, moved my ancestors from the area of Nakhchevan to Isfahan. And he was an Englishman, and he was, uh, at the time of Queen Elizabeth I, he was in Iran um, on his adventures, and he was employed by the Shah of Iran to reorganize his army. 
Um, so uh, encouraged by fellow artists during a festival in York, I did a performance piece uh, responding to the photographs that I'd created, which was um, using projections and uh, exploring um, m multiple identities, both of myself and of Armenians who are within the diaspora. And out of that came another performance piece, which was Packing, where I, um, I interviewed um, the librarian of the Armenian Institute and his wife, because they were also Armenians from Iran, and I asked how um, her experience had influenced her. And Packing became a performance piece in Salon Mashup, again curated by the Armenian Institute and set of white, and this was at Shoreditch Town Hall, uh, where a friend who was an Armenian dancer created Packing again. And Swallows and Armenians is my current project, which is very much based in the experience of Cumbrian, kind of adventuring. Arthur Ransom, who is an English writer, wrote Swallows and Amazons, which became a classic of English literature. And it was actually based on a family of Anglo-Armenians from Aleppo, um, whom he'd met through his old friend, who was the children's mother, Dora Collingwood, who became Dora Altunyan. And I'm revealing the uh, hidden face of what we presume to be white English, but actually were multi-ethnic children uh, living in Aleppo. And uh, Shaka has come with me on this project where she brings her Armenian Circle of Life dance event to the Lake District and into the touring exhibition that I created uh, as part of that whole research project, which has become a theatre piece and which was, had its world premiere with the Cumbria Opera Group last year in Appleby in Cumbria with a series of actor musicians playing the children and the family in their relationship with Arthur Ransom. So we're coming to um, Armenian coffee, and uh, I'm going to um, be reading this poem for you today um, because I think it's really important that um, we don't continue to feel as Armenians a sense of hopelessness and powerlessness, um, that making work enables us to... Um, they keep a sense of resilience and support of each other. And it gives you a sense of what is going on, what has happened, and what is going on to Armenian, our Armenian community as we speak. A brass coffee pot, Arabic inscription. One spoon of coffee, Edna's. Made in Los Angeles by Armenians, immigrants from Iran. Bought off Kensington High Street in a Persian shop price extortionate. Together, we are a strange concoction a long way from where we began. My forebears from the region of Nakhichevan, now inside the borders of Azerbaijan, came from the town of Jura. 400 years past, their hard-won success was financed by trade built on silk. Chock full of fine churches, superior houses, it roused the sovereign Abbas. This Shah, so ruthless, killed or blinded his sons to Kay, stay king of kings, Shah Han Shah. He burnt it all down, their town, forcing them to resettle in Isfahan, his capital, Nisve Jahan. In half the world, they created a new Jura, as Armenians are wont to do. And their taxes of silk financed his empire. All that was left of that township superior was a cemetery, but one of exceptional criteria. UNESCO's heritage status bestowed was swayed by caviar diplomacy. They said not a word as it was hammered to dust, mindlessly ordered by history revisionists that wiped away all trace of our past with their fists. Instead, they declared Azerbaijan land of tolerance. What a joke. Once the coffee's drunk, leave the dregs. But that's where future lies. Balance carefully the saucer on top, then in one swift turn towards the heart, upend the cup. Let be whilst coffee sludge, gravity pulled, congeals into a muddy puddle below. Patience. Now look. The future's bleak, it says. 
Look here, her face, the black Madonna, now her eyes put out by what she sees, gazes into a pit of decrepitude, murder and lies, her churches and sacred sites reduced to rubble and sighs. That old grandfather, Artsakh, gra dragged from his house, cries, what have I done to you? Whilst young guns, aroused, slice off his ears. Bloody and battered, he dies. Meanwhile, their algorithms churn out fake news, inventing atrocities to mirror their own. The world jostles to get the best views. Armenian David against Azeri Goliath in a mismatched game of thrones. Syrian mercenaries, salaries paid by King Turk, along their soldiers skin alive and behead POWs, taking pictures and posting the revolting carnage on victims' own phones, a gruesome keepsake for their loved ones to own. The president of Turkification begins the task, finishes the task begun by his forebears. 1915 to 1923, 1.5 million murdered, tortured and raped, hacked to pieces, thrown off cliffs, burnt in churches, hungry, thirsty and diseased, stripped of clothes and dignity, forcibly converted, still refused to die out. In 2020, their survivors faced a stark choice, a second genocide, or to give up their historic lands, a shady deal brokered by a Russian oligarch with a pumped up body and smile of a cat. Now a new spat. The Armenian population, first united towards victory, in defeat implodes. Those who bulk at the ransom's high price refuse to see its spared young lives. 44 days of war in 2020, over Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh, were not the first days, nor the last. Hatred manifests in Baku's trophy parks, where children play under canopies of helmets taken from Azerbaijan's dead enemies, and monstrous mannequins of Armenian soldiers are a grotesque parody of Madame Tussaud fakery. Two years' grace bought by Russian peacekeepers has vanished since Putin's attention to, turned to special operations, Ukraine style. Mark the date, 13th of September 2022, Azeri King Supreme, egged on by despot Erdogan, with superlative confidence now attacks Armenian sovereignty. He draws his pistols, crying, Annihilation or your land! Pashinyan, Armenian's prime minister, is ready to sign on the dotted line. Whilst Goris, Jermuk, Artanish, Sotk, Vartenis, Ishkhanasar, Kapan, the border towns of this historic land, bear the brunt of human lives. Putin asserts, our strategic ally, good friend Armenia, don't cry. And Erdogan sends condolences to Azerbaijan as their soldiers rape Anusha Apetian, a female POW who is shot and then dismembered. Pictures of her body on social media are shared. Her severed fingers had been pushed into her mouth and a stone rammed into one honey-coloured eye as if they couldn't stand her dead gaze, witness to their depravity. This time... Even some Azeris are moved to speak up, speak out against this moral bankruptcy. Is this the price we still have to pay? In 2023, genocide has not gone away. So now a new strategy. Time to prove himself a worthy man. Aliyev and his cronies hatch a plan. December 12, 2022, would-be eco-warriors answered his call. Big busted grandmothers, hats pulled tight against the cold, throw dead doves of peace into the air. Oh, it's pure theatre. Then fresh-faced teenagers plump on a diet of pure loathing of Armenians, dress preppy style in Team Aliyev attire, play their part too well in the payroll of the Grand Master, Azerbaijan's cruel regime that does not bear dissent in its own street, but turns a blind eye on this youthful charade. The irony is not lost on us. 
They look like us. We look like them. Their banners block the only road into Nagorno-Karabakh, their occupied lands, our Artsakh. Let nothing in, let no one out. What fun, we'll see how long they last. But these little Armenians, they still sing and dance. So block off the gas pipes, roars the Grinch. Turn off the electricity. But oh, see how these pathetic Ermeni tweet and insta their complaints. What? The internet still works, so shut it down, he spits. Now the world can't see their day-to-day -day laments. He sniggers and watches with not a drop of remorse how the bitter winter's spent, stretching out small rations, no chocolates or treats given here, no fruit to savour or vegetables appear to fill hungry bellies. Instead, they shiver with the cold. Children do homework by candlelight, epileptics fit for lack of drugs, Premature babies die for need of incubators. Old men's hearts burst for want of stents. There is no fuel, no work for idle hands to do. Not even the International Court of Human Rights can make these young hooligans open the road. Their ruling makes no difference. Not a jot. The eco charade is over. It was never a thing, a thin disguise. Now a military checkpoint appears before our eyes. Welcome to Azerbaijan. 40 days of Musadar pales against 132 days and counting of Artsakh. And we in the diaspora bear witness to this shameful act. All they seek is self-determination, but Azerbaijan's hatred of this nation trumps their human rights. The right to food, to light, to warmth, to work, to health and dignity. Hashtag our existence is resistance. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, let's move to the next speaker and uh, let's leave the space for questions after uh, all uh, panelists present. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Tatevik uh, Ayvazian. Tatevik is a London-based writer and producer with Rebel Republic Films and the former director of London's Armenian Institute. Uh, she is the poetry producer of the award-winning short art house film, Taniel, narrated by Sean Bean. Her work on Taniel Varojan poetry in Western Armenian resulted in collaboration with an anthology with London's Modern Poetry Library on endangered, endangered languages. She is currently working on adapting Iris Murdoch's The Italian Girl, optioned by uh, Rebel uh, Republic Films. Tatevik is also the producer of Married to the Music, a feature-length music documentary about female DJs, and uh, Silence, a short film uh, based on oral history from the Nagorno-Karabakh War. Tatevik has uh, curated film festival for several years in partnership with uh, Classiki, a streaming platform at Saint Lumiere and online, and uh, has also been uh, as on a selection panel uh, Calvert Journal Film Festival. Uh, she is on the board of directors of International Armenian Literary Alliance, focused on their translation projects, and uh, a board of uh, board member of Azad Archives. <laughs> Okay, welcome. No, please don't <laughs> apologize for, for being such an accomplished artist. This country is at war. Thank you, everyone. Um, was a wrong move to come after Karen, after the, all the emotion she put in her poem. Thank you, Karen. 
and thank you Centrala for having me and everyone putting this event together. Um, idea of a safe space or I think you were saying a space of empathy was mentioned before. Uh, and over the last few years I've talked a lot about what is it being like an Armenian creative about the war, about Armenian genocide. And to be honest, I was self-censored. There's so much pain you can show. You make a joke, you make a small talk, you downplay it. I'm sure everyone will know it. This place is one of the rare occasions I thought I can be as naked as I can about the pain. And special thank you to everyone, Alicia and your team, for creating this. Um, and the presentation putting together, I was putting together the day Karen was just talking about, when the latest military checkpoint was installed on the last bridge leading to Nagorno-Karabakh, which is, if you don't know, it's an ethnic Armenian enclave. Uh, and 120,000 people are stranded there and dying, and some of them are friends, some of them are relatives. I spoke in the morning with my friend Tigran, who said, I'm sitting, I'm watching my mom die because her heart, we run out of her heart medication. So I apologize if this comes with heavy baggage of pain, but I think this is a rare, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk about it. I'm also afraid that I'm speaking from an immense place of privilege because I'm British Armenian, and I live, and I talk about this sitting in my nice, comfortable flat in North London, when my 20-year-old son is nice and comfortable and safe, while my friends in Armenia send their 20-year-old to war without knowing what will happen. The trailer you just saw is from my short film, Taniel, which was finished a few years ago. And as an Armenian, you grow up. Uh, I'm a descendant of Armenian genocide survivors from both sides. Uh, my mom's granddad was a survivor. He lived a very long life, 90-something year old, and he talked a lot. I mean, I think it was his secret of <laughs> such long life. He, no trauma, nothing internalizing. It's like, oh, do you want, to, do you want the story how they butcher my family? Here we go. So you grow up with it. It's in your veins, it's in your blood. So the minute you start create something, you have to tell the genocide story. And Tanil is about Tanil Varjan, an Armenian poet who was Oops, what am I doing? Oh, sorry. Um, there's this beautiful man on the right who was killed, tortured so unspeakably, I cannot repeat the details here, only because he was Armenian. He wasn't political. He, he was writing poetry about wine and love and beautiful women. He was cruel, tortured. This is our beautiful actor, Tigran Kaboyan. So as an Armenian creative, I just want to sort of describe to what is it like being an Armenian creative in conflict. You're born, you just grow up with this weight of history and genocide and displacement you were talking about for 100 years ago. You carry a weight of small words. This is wonderful, Sean Bean. I had a huge pleasure of sitting with him and recording him reading poetry very shortly after Azerbaijan attacked this wonderful part of Armenia. This is Armenia proper. This is not even disputed territory. So I had to be strong, polite, and very professional with Sean Bean, who was as professional, knowing they were sending beheaded bodies of 18 years old, barely children back from Tavos. And I thought we, You've got to keep creating and creating, and this is Gara Berberian, the director of the film, my very talented creative partner. So there are these small wars never end. Everyone who experienced, all of you, Yugoslavians, Ukrainians, you can, it's never, that's it, we're done, we're moving on. There were tensions over the border, there were, this is the four days war, I think you also mentioned in your <laughs> poem, Chronology, Karen. A weight of big war came in 2020. For me, it came in the face of this. On the right is my beautiful goddaughter, Goharik, on her engagement date, two weeks before the war. Two weeks later, Alex, her fiance, was sent to Nagorno-Karabakh to serve. 
and the uh, Israeli drone exploded just over him. And this is a cruel war. It's a drone shooting on you. It's not, it's not, you cannot fight against it. He's alive. He's fine. He has a broken spine. His spleen is removed. Goharik tells me for third year he hasn't slept a night without waking up screaming. And two of his friends were blown to pieces, so he doesn't know where they are. Uh, so you, you're creative, but you have this information in your head. You, it's not some disattached, it's not an article on BBC website. This is my goddaughter. So we're carrying this weight on our shoulders. And there's the weight of horrors I won't talk about. And I'm grateful for Karen to have the courage to speak about these things because everything she mentioned in her, her poem is real. The Victory Park in Azerbaijan where they displayed the helmets of dead soldiers or mannequins of Armenians and everything else. And there are stories I read and I wake up and think, how do you live with the knowledge that another human being is capable of this. Um, when growing up, I grew up in Soviet Union. I was born in Armenia. We'd hear stories about World War II. It was sort of romanticized. It was a war between men, a man fighting a man. Things have changed somehow. We've entered the new era of cruelty. And I feel like tainted and scarred and maimed by this knowledge of these things happened and we have to live with this as well. These are some of the things we try to do at the Armenian Institute. We try to talk about these events. It was hard as hell. It was hard as hell, me worrying about cousins at war, people I know. There were events I would <laughs> take a glass of wine before they had to, I had to be on Zoom and speak. We tried to raise money, we read poetry, we brought the ambassador to talk to us. It all in vain because the wars, wars don't care, they're cruel, they're gone. But then also, you want to create, you want to do things, you want to, I'm British creative as well. I belong to the filmmaking industry in this country. So these are the two projects I'm involved in. Alicia mentioned this is the Italian girl adaptation. This is the cover of the book, beautiful cover. And uh, thank you for Tina for inviting me to talk about it. And the other one is um, a to the music about female DJs in house music documentary. And why I want to talk about this, if you, why I want to say a few words. Whatever you do in arts, it's interconnected. You don't say, okay, I've done my Armenian thing, I'm moving on. If you talk about social issues, you talk about social issues. The Italian girl talks about um, homosexuality being illegal, female rights, being a foreigner, being a Jew in this country. Uh, Married to the Music is specifically looking at gender inequality. These are all interconnected issue, whatever you do as a creative, I think Paul spoke very eloquently about it, uh, that all art is somehow relevant and interconnected, whatever you do. So these are two other projects I'm focusing on, and they are my <laughs> light relief away from the weight of being an Armenian creative, and it brings some light. And this is why it's wonderful to have solidarity of your creatives who don't see you as just the Armenian, the Eastern European, the Middle Eastern, or whatever label is attached to you at that point. Uh, this is, you will rec recognize this, this is, I want to be very <laughs> positive, one of the most special, with our film tunnel, we traveled the world with Tanyal. Um, um, we've won about 20 awards with it. But one of my favorite, favorite screenings, and I'm not saying because I'm here, was at Centrala. It was an intimate small screening downstairs. I was a group of people, non-Armenians mostly. And we talked and talked, and people came to ask questions about poetry. It was such a joy. 
It was also happening on 24th of April, which is the genocide, Armenian Genocide Commemoration Day, and I appreciated the courage to do this in this country where Armenian ge genocide is not recognized, but Centrala could stand up and say, this is something which happened, we're honoring. And it's, it's a special feeling that as a creative, someone sees and acknowledges your work. Um, only way of dealing with it, what to do, I keep talking, <laughs> you've noticed. I'm working with International Armenian Literary Alliance. We're translating works from Armenian to English. I'm working on a short film which is based on testimonies from first 2020 war, which is extremely hard, extremely emotional, but also important to tell this story. I'm co-editing Vasafiri, which is a British magazine's uh, 2024 issue dedicated fully to Armenia. Um, so I'm trying to find some common edge of being an Armenian, being a creative, and not being just pigeonholed as someone who came from some small country we don't know. Um, and this is, just want to finish with this picture, this is a um, monument in Artsakh, which is now in blockade, sending all the love and solidarity to them. And I know I have a minute or two uh, to go, and I just wanted to say something um, Father touched upon earlier on, how your trauma is seen. Um, all the wars are traumatic, Everyone is scarred, everyone is scarred, but wars are also unequal. A big country attacks a small country. A NATO member, Turkey, aided by Israel, attacks Armenia with two and a half million population. Gigantic Russia attacks another country. Somehow the sheer impact is so unequal, unprecedented, the causes are unequal. So it's very important, I think, and I felt it, unfortunately, the both sides in British media open any BBC article about Armenia. It will say, Armenia says this and Azerbaijan says this. And I'm like, BBC, make your bloody mind up. You are journalists, you're there to tell the truth. And 120,000 people are dying of hunger. There is no says this or says that. I think, and this is first time I think I the only space I'm talking about this so openly, but it's important not to be scared to take sides. Um, to say this side is wrong, this side is wrong. It's nothing wrong with blaming states and powers. Of course, it's never, people are, I personally am worried to say these things because taken personally or offending personalities, but I know lots of Azeris who are very anti-war and they're very courageous and they speak up. And by going back to the question I think Tina was asking earlier when we were speaking how you create these spaces, it's tiny, tiny, tiny steps. Um, when talking about the takeover of Vasafiri magazine, um, they had, it's a literary magazine of translated literature, if you don't know. I looked at which other countries have done a takeover, and there's a Balkans takeover, which warmed my heart, and I got in touch with the editor, Vesna Gothos, a wonderful writer, and I said, how the hell did you do this woman? Like, how did you even sat down? Or said everyone was mourning. Serbs were like, you included too many Croats, and they were posting and saying, why there are so many Albanians? But she did it, and she said, would you envisage a Caucasus issue one day? And I, I cannot even consider that question, not even think or execute it. We are so, so far from that. So when, Vada, you were saying about this horizontal connections and conversations are impossible, I, I feel what you're saying, but we have to make tiny, tiny, tiny steps, even today speaking about all of this openly to all of you, I feel a bit 
emboldened. Uh, sorry, I got a bit too emotional. I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tatevik. Uh, it's a privilege to listen to both of your very personal stories. Thank you for sharing and uh, being so brave uh, to share those stories with, uh, with us. Um, now I can see Anna is uh, uh, on the screen. Uh, uh, hello, Anna. Can you hear us? Hello, Alicia. Yes, I can Hi. hear you. Okay. Thank you for uh, joining us. I will just uh, do a little introduction uh, before your presentation. Anna Kamai is an uh, Armenian-based independent curator, cultural manager and producer who organizes community-based art projects with the goal of using public space and contemporary art to meet local needs. Uh, Anna curated two major exhibitions tackling the issue of Syrian refugees in Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, The Newcomers, Syrian in Armenia in 2016, and Home to Home 2017. She is the founder of Artsakh Fest, the first international contemporary art festival in Nagorno-Karabakh, aimed at healing the war trauma, overcoming the isolation of the conflict-ridden region, and revitalizing the abundant theater building in Stepanakert, which once used to be a community center of the city. Currently, she is st studying permaculture and working on establishing experimental art as a residency for mothers in art as a way of art workers to reconcile their artistic practice with uh, motherhood. So, um, um, Anna, when you're ready, just uh, you can make a start. Thank you, Alicia. Yes, um, I'm ready to start. But first of all, I would like to thank uh, Centrala and you personally for organizing this amazing uh, exchange of experience. And um, uh, the stories of Ukrainian artists were very interesting. I've been following the whole uh, conference, trying to um, not to miss anything. Uh, so it was very interesting to see how uh, Ukrainian artists, especially females in arts, uh, are struggling in UK and um, especially the ones who have kids. And it was mind blowing for me to see that, you know, there's this humiliating practice of reporting each, each week um, to the job center to explain like what has been done to find a job. Um, but I mean, yeah, um, and also the Balkan artist experience was very um, uh, uh, powerful because, yeah, they've been through it and there's a lot that we can learn from them. And uh, yeah, the conflict stays, the war uh, memory is uh, with us and we need like a, a total new generation to um, overcome uh this vicious cycle because uh, even though we thought that the new generation will not face uh, what we've been through already for a three, like three, four generations, in 2020, uh, we still faced it. So maybe uh, we can play the video first and then I will uh, continue. It's fine, I'll do it later. My name is Laura Arena, and I'm an artist and curator from New York City. And the project that I did for this festival is called Learning How to Fly. It's part of a, a broader project that I started two years ago, and it's about my journey to connect to my roots, um, specifically uh, coming from a mixed race Native American person whose tribe is denied identity in the United States. And so this project itself is about connecting to your ancestors. So I asked people to write a message on a piece of paper to their ancestor, be it in your family lineage or an ancestor to this land or ancestor in the way of your trade or the type of work that you do. So all the people that come before you. And then together we made a paper airplane 
and then we flew it. And I just wanted people to like bodily express this like letting go of this message. And then today, I um, added the paper planes to this installation. It's kind of like magic to see how this building has been transformed. To see this, this theater now full of life and full of people and sound. Human beings have so much possibility to really like recreate their environment if they have the will and the power to do so. Looking for a great deal on your next trip? Find low prices for flights, hotels. <laughs> yeah, whenever you're ready, just let me know when you want me to change the slide. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, uh, can you hear me? Cool. Um, uh, so uh, this uh, artist, Laura Arena, is one of the 40 artists that participated in the um, uh, first edition of Artsakhvest uh, back in 2018. And um, I think this could be a good example of how it's possible to create like a space of compassion or empathy um, in, a, in a place where there is an ongoing conflict. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, I wanted you to see this video because this is what it was all about. Um, and then maybe you can change the slide and I'll try. Yeah, so uh, just to introduce myself, um, I consider myself a multi-potentialite. So uh, my practice, my creative practice uh, is uh, uh, centered around um, writing and then creating documentaries uh, about stories that matter in my community and um, community building through events like festivals and exhibitions. Next slide, please. And so um, I did work um, uh, with Syrian refugees a lot when the war in Syria started and I moved back from Morocco to Armenia. Um, so we had uh, this big wave of Armenian, ethnically, or mostly Armenian, but there were also Assyrians and Arabs, of course, uh, refugees coming to Armenia. And Armenia was this kind of a transit zone, just like uh, Moldova is right now. And um, uh, not only Moldova, there are several countries where Ukrainians are finding um, a temporary home while the conflict is ongoing. And I really wanted to highlight the resilience of people uh, who are fleeing from an active conflict and finding refuge in a new environment um, and being able to start a new. So that was my aim when I was doing those festival, uh, those uh, exhibitions of storytelling and um, uh, interviews with the Syrian Armenians. And then uh, I lived in Nagorno-Karabakh in 2017 for a whole year and I really uh, was trying to explore how it is like to live in this militarized zone where uh, people three generations in a row have only seen conflict and war and uh, how it's possible to uh, live through that. And uh, so that's how I found the theater building in, uh, in Stefanakert and it was abandoned and uh, it's considered the most beautiful building in the city. And turned out that when I was researching the history of the building, turned out that that's where the Armenian theater from Baku was uh, um, kind of uh, accommodated after they closed down the theater in Baku. And uh, so they moved to Stepanakert. And 
the local community was going to the theater uh, on a weekly basis. They would go see the same performances over and over again because it was the community space. So I thought that it's very important to bring life to this building and also to bring the community back together. Uh, next slide, please. Um, oh yeah, so um, this is another project. Um, it's about it's well, it, it, it's a larger project which was called Nice to Meet You Yerevan, organized by um, my colleagues uh, from Switzerland who also participated in Artsakh Fest, and so they invited lots of artists from the festival to a residency in Solothurn, Switzerland, and then we had a parallel event in Yerevan at ICA, the Institute of Contemporary Arts, and that was before pandemic, but we were. Um, Kind of broadcasting live whatever was happening um, in Yerevan in Switzerland and whatever was happening in Switzerland opening and in Yerevan. So we also had events and all of this was about borders, about uh, our un like Armenian artists being underrepresented, their voices being muted, and the inability uh, for Armenian creatives to to be present and to. Um, intervene into into the western um art uh, art and culture spheres because of visas because of all these difficulties to obtain it and uh yeah uh, the context so this is um these are works by Vahag Hamalbashan and he made paintings uh of all the visa re rejections letters that he received and he's an established armenian artist uh contemporary artist and uh so this was one of the uh exhibitions uh shows that we uh, uh hosted during this uh event another one please the next one yeah and then in 2019 i did the second edition uh, of arts fest and uh, it was quite uh, successful even though it was a little bit uh scandalous because there were these um uh, ceramic rabbits that also resembled the penis uh, because uh, it was like the male masculine energy of war protruding from the walls of the theater and there were some other uh, graphic uh, paintings by David Kochuns that uh, the Minister of Culture Nagorno Karabakh uh, asked me to remove but we didn't remove it till the very end but yeah there are these kind of issues when uh doing into uh, some interventions on a land that is not uh, you know where there's a traditional society and uh, almost nothing is happening in the in the cultural landscape in terms of contemporary art this kind of things can happen next one please and then you know I was producing documentaries a lot and it, it all had to do with our social context borders uh, women's rights, human rights in general. And uh, this one uh, is a short movie. It's called um, The the Conscript, basically. The drafted, the person that was... T because we have two years military service, as the previous speakers mentioned. Uh, so it's a compulsory military service for every Armenian citizen who's a male. And we were following the life of this boy from Vosgebar village, which is uh, bordering Azerbaijan. And <clears throat> before the 2020 war, most of Armenian uh, boys would go to serve in Nagorno-Karabakh. And so this film is the is his uh, story uh, of how he got drafted from the border of uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan to the border of Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan. And uh, it's kind of prophetic because at the end of the film, we finished filming, I think, in 2019. And then he said that um, he thinks that in a year's time, this conflict is going to resolve either through a war or through diplomatic efforts. And he hoped that it will be through diplomatic efforts. But eventually the war happened. So, yeah, it was kind of a prophecy, a scary, very scary prophecy that he did. So this film was already shown in many festivals. It traveled the world and um, got recognition. And I'm happy that it was also shown at Golden Apricot Film Festival in Armenia last year. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah. And so this is, uh, I think, the biggest project that I worked on in collaboration with Francois Jacob, who is a, a Canadian director. And um, 
we've been filming for over four years in Armenia, Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh, and uh, the Armenian and Azerbaijani diaspora. Uh, I was only producing the part in Armenian Nagorno-Karabakh, obviously, because Armenians cannot go to Azerbaijan. And uh, this is considered to be uh, the, the most neutral take on the conflict from both sides. Uh, though both sides hate it, <laughs> but just in case of, um, I think it's a good sign because, uh, yeah, but in, from both sides, uh, we, like, I receive feedback that it's not, <laughs> it's not really um, the complete picture that, you know, like we're, we're missing some points, but overall under the same sun, and that's the name of the film. Uh, it's written in French. It's called under the same sun. And this film has also toured the world, but it, it didn't make it to Armenia yet because the local festival didn't film festival did not um, it just ignored uh, the application and we, but I still need to organize the screenings in our region because it's a pity that things need to be approved by the West for us in our region to accept it and embrace it, you know? Yeah, next one, please. Oh, and so this is my latest work and I haven't even finished the subtitles in English, so I won't be able to show you a trailer, but this is about um, what, like, this is essentially what I think the issue is in our region, but also I think in all the conflicts, it's that um, female voices uh, who are demographically like the, um, maybe uh, half of the population at least, are muted and uh, mothers of soldiers especially, but also of mothers, all the women are the ones who are impacted by the war more than anybody because they need to also deal with the aftermath and they need to deal with everyday life without the presence of their um, partners or fathers or um, sons. And so uh, I wanted to vocalize those voices of um, Armenian and Nagorno uh, women of Armenia and Nagorno Karabakh, but also Azerbaijani women who have experienced war firsthand. So we've been for like over two years, we've been interviewing um, refugees, uh, women living on the line of contact, which is the borderline, uh, academics, activists, and mothers about about their experience of the war, the the first war in the nineties, and then you know we and then we were filming during the war as well because uh, initially I did not mean to, I did not know that this war is going to start in 2020. So it was mostly a retrospective of what has happened. But then when the war started, we decided not to stop filming, but to include this experience as well of women who are, who have experienced the 2020 war. And so um, there is even a reference to the Ukrainian conflict where uh, Arzu Abdullaeva, who's a um, human rights activist from Azerbaijan, is uh, mentioning that the, the, the human, dehumanization of uh, people, uh, dehumanization of enemy is what is taking place uh, in our conflict, just as well as it's happening in Ukraine right now. So I think that it's very important to, uh, to, to, stay, to stick to our commonality uh, as humans uh, versus our differences because <clears throat> otherwise we cannot um, overcome this uh, divides created by the system, by the governments and uh, by the mainstream rhetoric propaganda. Next slide, please. And so, yeah, um, I think that, uh, yeah, eventually, like, after, like while I was filming, when I finished filming, I, I thought that I decided that I don't want to live in a city anymore and I need to live in the countryside closer to the nature. And also I wanted to create a space, a holistic space for women in arts to be able to create uh, not being uh, separated from their children because in our culture of separation, um, we, we as women, as mothers, uh, do not have the same opportunities as male artists, male uh, art workers because um there is no space in the in the contemporary art world for us no platform to be present and no um, chance to uh 
you know, continue doing what we're doing uh, in a political, in the personal and political sense, because uh, raising children is not only personal, but political. And so I really hope soon that I'm going to start my residency. And I have also given up on the idea of this uh, romanticized community where, um, you know, everybody's uh, same, like, uh, has the, shares the same values as you and uh, thinks that similar way has the same life philosophy because this is not realistic. And so um, now I'm based in Dilijan. It's been already three years. And I'm trying to uh, create my own community with people that I interact with on my everyday, uh, in, a, in an everyday basis. And so um, the people around me is very important. So communities is, all, is very important. And staying solid and connected with others is very important. And uh, this is why I included the picture where I'm toasting, because that was last week in Yerevan, where there was um, a cultural academy for um, art workers from uh, Georgia, Abkhazia, and Armenia, and uh, Moldova, and Transnistria, basically two other conflict zones with unrecognized territory. And so being connected with this kind of people uh, who, are, who are living in similar situations is very, very important. Learning from others, experience, comparing and drawing parallels is very, very important, but also very important for me is the education of our children. And so I've been running a homeschool and summer camp last year, and that's the other picture from. Those are the two are, uh, yeah, those are like, it's in my house. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, so basically I've been doing this for uh, my friend's kids and like creating free safe space for uh, free play which they are deprived of in public schools and uh, yeah, being connected to the nature and also staying like having their parents present as much as possible. So that's what I've been working on. And uh, if you have any questions, maybe I'm done. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, we're going to have uh, some time for questions. Um, I want to just to start saying how, uh, how important this panel is uh, in the context of uh, our current uh, exhibition uh, of uh, Armenian um, collective Yerevan Art Lab. Um, uh, I have been working for many years actually to prepare, uh, prepare trying to pr uh, put together this um, exhibition. Uh, I traveled to Armenia for the first time in 2018. Uh, and then lots of different things happen, war, pandemic, uh, different uh, complications, but the uh, show is uh, finally here. Uh, the uh, idea behind it was uh, always very strongly to present uh, Eastern Europe uh, as it is, and to combat this uh, Western European view of, you, uh, of Europe as this very uh, you know, peaceful continent, you know, very civilized and cultured, and uh, um, <clears throat> uh, but without an uh, acknowledgement of, of of Eastern Europe and, and the fact that uh, uh, quite a large uh, part of uh, Europe is in conflict or in constant threat of conflict of or, or war, and this is very very different perspective. Uh, and also, uh, Armenia is on a totally the other end of Europe when we looked from 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 British uh, British perspective. But anyway, so uh, uh, I'm quite proud that we have uh, this show here, and we can talk about Armenia and conflict. Uh, and um, just wanted to mention the situation. A uh, few months ago, I've attended kind of large cultural. Um, conference and when speaking with kind of medium-sized art organization from Britain uh, I was asked what's your upcoming exhibition so I've mentioned yeah we have this Armenian show and the response was oh yes this is very important now especially now that me media is co um, uh, covering all these Albanians crossing the channel <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <Yeah. laughs> so um, yeah. there is my question to yeah. Tatevik and Karen yeah. do you think uh, this solidarity, uh, empathy, interest can only exist when the war is a news or conflict is a news? Or, or do you manage in your practice to find platforms and you, to find audience for what, what you want to say? 
I'm, I'm constantly talking about the Armenians and the genocide. People are sick of hearing me talk about it in my circles, uh, art circles and, and Facebook <laughs> circles and Instagram circles. And it's the main topic in my, in my own practice. But I also, I mean, I try not to be a bore about it, but I think it's really important to keep, to keep people informed about what's going on and also um, about the rich cultural heritage that is within Armenia the, and, and Iran as well, you know, because I'm kind of triple heritage, really. It's quite a complicated layering of identities. Um, you know, the West tends to look on the East with a very kind of simplified eye and, and the kind of... Uh, so, anyway, I kind of feel that my role as, um, as a British well, an Anglo-Armenian artist from Iran is to redress that balance so that I'm, I am bringing it up, I'm talking about it, and my work, the work that I make, is accessible to ordinary, normal people. Um, my current projects, the Swallows and Armenians, and, and uh, the books that I've written and the exhibitions that I've participated in, which I talked about there, are not the only part of my practice. And what I didn't really talk about is the kind of socially engaged part of my practice within my own community in Appleby. Um, uh, six years ago, I got a, an award for Cumbria Artist of the Year. It was the first time that in my region I was recognised. And that made me smile, really, because they saw me as a Cumbrian artist for the first time, mm -hmm. by virtue of the fact that I live in that geography, in that mm -hmm. geographical area. But that's given me quite a lot of then status in that community. And since then, my town council has come to me to run three projects in the community. I've established a, a, a small women's cooperative arts workshop that is now self-run. Everybody knows me as the work I do as an artist, but they also know that I'm Armenian and they also know that I was born in Iran. So I'm, I'm familiarising, my role is to familiarise the other and to, to kind of... Uh, to bring that information, really, to just normal people. It's OK being recognised in academic circles, but actually, if the wider population doesn't understand what's going on, it's kind of they're the majority, really. And through my work, I'm able to kind of democratise access to the arts, but also access to information and access to politics and what's going on. So it is a, an important part of what I do. Thank you. Um, I think Karen's response was quite comprehensive. Just to add a few words, definitely yes to your question, It's if it's in the news. Um, these days, people mostly know Armenians thanks to Kim Kardashian, I have yeah. to say, uh, truly. <laughs> and uh, yes, I've been mistaken for an Albanian or Romanian very often. Uh, and Armenia rarely makes the news, but when I'm seen, I think I'm expected to be the Armenian performer. A few circles have talked about the music document, which is about house music, and as it has Revolution Manchester, it's nothing to do with it. And people are like, oh, Armenian female DJs. I'm like, no, I can. I'm allowed to listen to <laughs> British music. I love, love house music. Um, so there is this constant double-edged sword that you want to explain your culture, your richness, but I think as Armenians as well, and Karen and Anna probably would agree, we need to learn to understand that it's, we're not the only people who carry a pain and a burden. I think what's really important, understanding of the others, what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in Syria, what's happening in Sudan now. I think it's very important not to be in competition that my pain is greater. My, my pain is better than your pain. Uh, so I was one of the most gratifying things recently to happen to me, the, being granted a commission to edit Vasafiri magazine, because I can bring Armenian fiction and poetry, Armenian science fiction. It's not all blood and tears and suffering that Armenian literature 99% is. Mm -hmm. There's 1% of fun stuff, and I want the British reader to read it in translation. 
Oh, thank you very much. And uh, Anna, um, I have a different question for you because uh, you live uh, in Armenia, you, you, you there, uh, constantly uh, facing conflict and, uh, and threat of uh, further escalation. Um, you know, the, uh, I'm, I'm very aware that, uh, you know, the Artsakh Fest uh, was an incredible achievement to create community there, to create a festival, to make it international festival. And I know that in uh, 2020, uh, war it just perished, and, and I know uh, how painful it was for you. Uh, I remember us talking about this. And uh, from, from a, a creative, artistic person uh, perspective, uh, what, uh, what would you say uh, give you strength to keep going and to keep working with people, not just focusing on, on art itself and on yourself, but constantly working with other people, building communities? Uh, what would you say is the source of strength and uh, motivation uh, in such a situation? Uh, thank you, Alicia. Uh, so basically, I think that uh, socially engaged art is the best tool to, to tackle the issues of um, conflict and war and war trauma. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> there is my baby That's around. <laughs> watch me back. <laughs> so, okay, watch me back. And so, um, yes, yeah, so, so I strongly believe that it's possible to achieve um, trauma healing and uh, um, kind of overcome this uh, conflict through communication and being in touch with, with people who have, who have directly experienced the conflict. And what gives me strength is knowing that, you know, we, like I do believe that there are more things uniting us than separating us across the borders everywhere, that humans have more things in common than differences despite of, of uh, all the uh, artificial divides created in our societies. And so I, I just, I think I, uh, knowing people on the other side in Azerbaijan uh, doing the same, what I do, it, with their limited means, because uh, taking into consideration that they live in a totalitarian regime, their lives are more in danger than mine. Uh, I think that gives me st a strength that I'm not the only one fighting for uh, for it, and um, uh, the the fact that I realize that uh, each of us are responsible for our own uh, reactions to whatever's happening, and uh, yeah, uh, embracing radical responsibility helps me a lot too. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, and maybe at this point we can open the questions to the floor. Anyone? Oh. It's not really a question. I just want to say thank you because um, uh, there is a kind of this big question when one stops being a war artist. Um, and it is along the lines, like when one stops being a, an exile, when one stops being refugee, refugee when, when this demarcation uh, happens in, in one's life, or when the past starts infusing the work that you're doing, for example, commercially in this case. So I really like this kind of blurring of lines that uh, that you have described, so I just uh, wanted to thank you for that, and especially for this idea that uh, art is a vehicle to provide access to difficult projects, and this negotiation of practice and content happens all the time, and it was uh, really nice uh, to hear uh, from you, and not that it's only me thinking about this. Uh, and I also want to say thank you to Anna, because uh, um, I practice a lot in social engaged arts and I feel that a lot of power comes from that engagement. So um, I really like this panel. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I, I think I just wanted to for a moment move to um, 
mothering within arts. Um, and I'm now just speaking as Tina, Tina, who uh, has seen her practice um, live very differently before I had children, and then when I had children, um, and even today, and actually kind of just thought when I saw Anna's child in the background thinking, oh, oh gosh, yes, this is sometimes the best way of um, just kind of sliding into that new fresh page going, okay, we, we are just reminded um, that there are other things, that there are other roles, and I'm not necessarily saying mothering is the only one. There is aunting, there is uncling, there is uh, communitying, there is, there is just that sort of concern and worry about uh, other immediate needs that we have that just tends to con tend to join us on a, on a, um, on a similar ground of that uh, sometimes awful multitasking or beautiful multitasking. What I really loved, and it's just really a comment, um, again, from Anna's presentation, is how much we tend to forget the nature and uh, the power of nature and also natural cycles in being with each other, in, in, in thinking about that next step that we take. Um, next te step that we take as humans, as political beings, but also as artists. When, I, when we are thinking, going back uh, to Marcela's question, how can art and what do we do as artists? In just thinking about different approaches, how we encourage empathy from another person. Just something I've been thinking about throughout this um, panel. Thank you. <laughs> Can I just answer that question slightly about mothering? I find myself now a position where my children are now my collaborators. Mm -hmm. And uh, my daughter has directed my production and written the music for it. And my, both of them are going to be filming and take, doing the audio sound recording, helping me to kind of edit the poem to put it online. So, you know, it's creatively collaborating with then these young adults that you have brought up initially, you know, in a kind of frustrated situation where, you, you know, you can't do the creative stuff that you wanted because the children are there, which is wonderful, but you also have to earn a living, which is also another an issue. And all of the frustration that comes with mothering in the early stages to the richness then that you have, you know, and these children have been brought up literally strapped to your front, you know, and have grown up with the smell of oil paint in their nostrils. They've seen how galleries function, they've seen how the art world works, and they, they're just kind of way ahead of you as adults, and they're teaching you how to do stuff now with new technologies. And But, you know, it's great to then suddenly, they're your collaborators, because you've kind of, yeah, influenced them so profoundly. <laughs> And um, yeah, so it's yeah. Keep it, keep keep the faith. You know, they'll be there with you at the at the end. Yeah. Hello. Um, I just want to go back to the question or the comment that was made earlier about um, art and war. So. From all the panels today, we heard how our first panel um, kind of raised the issue about you feeling, import feeling the importance of keeping the issue alive, talking about Ukraine, you know, every day so people don't forget it and, you know, still know that conflict is going. Um, yourselves are just saying now how important it is you're talking about Armenia in your social media everywhere. Anna says the same where she's already in, inside the country doing, doing the same. Do you feel as artist, because you're born artist, you're born to write poems or to do beautiful photography or paintings or, you know, all the um, uh, things within the art world, do you feel that war changes artists from, like, their passions, what they were born um, to do, like, instead of choosing to write for, I don't know, nature and doing a poem about, you know, something else, you now choosing your talent, you, you using your talent to do something um, with a different mission. Um, so how, how do you think that changes you as, as artists? And do you lose any of the artistic originality based on the talent that you, yeah. you had? 
uh, I have a need to make beautiful things, but I also have a need to speak the truth. And I think those two things are not mutually exclusive and that they can marry very effectively. And in fact, the beauty of uh, the beauty can m magnify the horror in a way. And I've always used that in my work, in fact. And my work has always been political, even though I've always tried to make beautiful things. It's a funny thing. And, and uh, you know, you can, you can still work um, exploring the aesthetics and the beauty of things without, you know, um, without sacrificing what art, what is the role really of art at the end of the day is to, I think one of the most important roles is to reflect what is happening in the moment and in the time that you're living in. So that is what I'm doing anyway, and I'm trying to do. But also perhaps um, uh, looking at history in another way and looking at history through the eyes of ordinary people and ordinary families and ordinary family life and how major events in history have affected. Because history books are usually written, have been written in the past by white Western men. So, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important story to tell, the story through the, the mouths of women, through the mouths of, you know, families, the stories of families. So, yeah, storytelling art making, living, expressing, and that's how you fill yourself. If I, if I may add, I agree 100% why are you an artist if you're not speaking the truth, and every art is political. Every art is political. Um, Yes, sometimes I do secretly wish I've been writing a script for a comedy, mm -hmm. but the need to speak the truth, like Karen says, and art is, art is magic. It, it's a vehicle to tell most horrible, horrific, tragic stories in a beautiful way. Uh, our film Tunnel talks about a gruesome, gruesome murder of a poet, but through exquisite visuals and music, somehow it touches the viewer much better if I went on just the Wikipedia page for them. So, no, it's not mutually exclusive, but I do wish I'd write a comedy one day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, hi. Um, so we've been talking a lot about um, like solidarity and maybe more like positive emotions, but uh, one thing that came to me when I was listening to the, the poem and then looking at the, the horrors of the past and the present, how do you deal with the negative emotions and I guess the desire for um, revenge or retribution or, um, and what do you think, yeah, justice, and what do you think the possibilities are for I guess the future of the conflict in Armenia, or how do you see it resolving itself, maybe? Uh, God, what a question. Uh, yeah. There's no revenge, there's no desire for revenge. I don't wish revenge on anyone. There's no thought of retribution in my head. But while powers, colonial powers, money, oligarchy, petrol, rule the world. Anna talked so eloquently about solidarity with other human rights writers. The latest book I've read is by a wonderful other writer called Akram Elisi, who is an eight-year-old man who wrote a book about horrors committed against Armenians. And his books, books were burned, literally made into piles, evoking images of Nazi Germany. And apparently there is a reward for anyone who will cut his ear and take it to Aliyev, but here we go. So I don't, at this point I'm despairing. At this point, the Western mean, sees Armenia very often as a Russian ally, which is a big joke because, well, no, Russia doesn't have any allies or cares about anyone or anything. Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. I just hope for peace and coexistence. 
And the sad thing is, a friend told me recently, because I witnessed the first Karabakh war, when Armenia and Azerbaijan still belong to the same country, Soviet Union, and he said the second world is cr crueler because the kids fighting each other, they don't know each other, they don't even speak the same language. They used to understand each other, they would speak Russian to each other, they would understand the same jokes. And now we're just so alien, you see each other as a bogeyman. So it's, it's a sad, sad state of affair for Armenia, stuck in, at the edge of Europe, <laughs> like we were saying next to Middle East, and... Uh, mm, yeah. uh, there used to be a, a kind of truth and reconciliation, as, as happened in South Africa, I feel. For, yeah. I don't feel need for revenge. I don't want an Azerbaijani female POW to be treated in that way. Uh, this was a mixed region. My family came from Nakhichevan, which is in Azerbaijan, and there were a lot of Azerbaijanis that lived in Nagorno-Karabakh, and they don't now. The, you know, the, it's become so polarized, so polarized that Azerbaijan feels that if, you know, unless there is not one Armenian left in Nagorno-Karabakh, then that is, you know, unacceptable. If, you know, if one person is left, that is unacceptable. I think that's what I meant. You know, they cannot, ha they cannot tolerate the thought of having Armenians in that land, which they feel that they deserved, but by virtue of a line being drawn in the land, in the, land by a, in the sand by a colonial power, you know, and ignoring what went before then and re recreating a whole new version of their hi history, you know, it, at the moment, it's so polarised that it's very difficult to imagine that Azerbaijan would come to the table with a kind of truth and reconciliation state status. Yeah. At the moment, it's it, it, the pain is just it's it's so deep, and as you say, the, the warfare has become so cruel that it really does resemble that pile of skulls, you know? Yeah. It feels like this is where we're heading. Yeah. And uh, when I think about the Armenian genocide that happened between 1915 and 1923, I think, how the hell did, was that, how did that happen? How did, how did that happen? A million and a half people, you know, in the way that they were brutally killed and, uh, and the way that they were treated. And now I know exactly how that can happen as we watch it happening. And nobody lifts a finger. Nobody, you know, airlifts air food to them. Nobody um, challenges the military checkpoint. Nobody challenged the eco, supposed eco camp that had sprung up, even though it was ridiculous. Everybody could see that it was all just, yeah. it was, it was, it was hilarious. It was, it was pure theatre. Uh, EU happily is buying oil from Azerbaijan, which is bitterly, bitterly ironic, instead of one dictatorial genocidal oligarch they're buying from another genocidal dictator. But uh, at this point, the thing is staying alive. Our government is utterly rubbish. There is no leadership. There is no strong leadership. Uh, diaspora is very fragmented, and diaspora and Armenians are much sizable than Armenians in Armenia. Uh, so I hope, I don't know, in five years' time, ten years' time, we were in a place we can even start talking about reconciliation, active conversations, connections. Sorry to be so negative. It's I wish really I really hard to... Anna, would you like to uh, reflect on that? Please. Yes. Um, Give us some I have, hand I'm not positive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had my hand raised for a while now because... I'm sorry, I have not noticed. All, I want to thank you uh, for inviting uh, females uh, if, um, instead of males to talk about all of this because males could have uh, done it too, yeah. but I think... We are uh, thoroughly lacking female perspective, so thank you very much, first of all, for that. Second of all, I'm so happy. I was just all smiles when I heard the comments from the audience, uh, and I'm so happy that the issue of motherhood in arts um, is relevant. Um, and um, yeah, uh, 
they are my my children are also my collaborators for sure and um uh, i think that we need to create an alternative system because i have no hope in uh, uh, our uh, the current system that uh, everything is organized with, like the diplomacy has failed, and that was clear uh, for a while now. Uh, I don't believe that the governments are going to solve these issues, but I also believe that everything is interconnected, and uh, it might sound naive, but I think that everything resolves. I, I, this is what I believe, that things resolve, and uh, each one of us, if we do our own part, if we do our own best, then uh, we will contribute to this alternative system that will be more just more fair and um, uh, there will be more uh, uh, place and space for coexistence and uh, different cultures and different ethnicities living in peace together just as it was in Nagorno-Karabakh before and uh, yeah so that's my hope that um, uh, each one of us doing our own part in this uh, we play a huge role, and we don't realize this role mostly because um, uh, our people has been taken, uh, like the agency has been taken from us for such a long time, for generations, and we do not feel this power. We don't feel empowered. We don't think that anything is in our hands. And this is what I hear also from people from active contact, uh, co conflict zones uh, a lot that we have not, we cannot decide anything. It's a big geopolitical game. We're just a pawn. Uh, but I do believe that uh, we do have the power, people have the power, and uh, through uh, working together, talking to each other, uh, is what's going to work out people to people and a bottom-up approach. This is what can work, in my opinion, and it has it's been already working. Um, there are lots of success stories, but we should never give up and we should claim our power back. That was been taken by, um, you know, systems by, by the colonizers, and uh, uh, and what give like what 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 I do. There is not there was not a question about what I do, what what I've been doing during the war or like what kind of feelings I'm, I've been going through and how I co coped with all of that. I can say that it was like lots of numbness that inability to create or to to be creative. It was just like staying focused on myself, on my feelings, trying to um, just take care of myself and my loved ones. But what helped me a lot was cooking and feeding people that I love. Um, this is like taking care of others, like people around me. This is what helped me, helped me go through that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Anna. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all panelists. Uh, unfortunately, we came to the end uh, of this uh, conference. So I just wanted to thank you all panelists, all guests and all participants at this conference. I think we had uh, several very good uh, conversation. Uh, there are some questions which uh, may still need to be answered, uh, but uh, uh, but I feel that we've uh, we've we've explored the themes of the co the conference uh, we wanted. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for uh, for joining us and agreeing to uh, speak at the conference. Um, and uh, our guest here in uh, in person, uh, if you uh, could uh, stay a few minutes, uh, we um, our uh, curator of the exhibition, Rafaelia, is going to uh, f uh, offer us an uh, exhibition tour. We just have to switch a few videos on and uh, make some space. So a quick, uh, maybe 10 minutes coffee break, and then we will start the tour. So don't go anywhere yet. <laughs> Thank you.